Jordan, I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married. The feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, it was, supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning and welcome to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and you are with Talk TV. You knew that already, but we're on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Coming up in this hour, MPs have rejected all 10 of the House of Lords amendments to the government's Rwanda bill. But ministers insist flights could still take off uh, with uh, channel migrants to the African nation within months. And Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves will pledge a decade of national renewal if Labour wins the general election. In a speech this evening, she will compare their challenges to those faced by Margaret Thatcher in 1979. We'll talk about that later. And after much online speculation about her health, a new video of the Princess of Wales outside a farm shop in Windsor has finally emerged, sparking renewed conspiracy theories. So what does the palace have to do to dampen them down? We'll talk about all of that. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Emma. Good morning. The controversial Rwanda bill is facing another bump in the road today after MPs rejected the House of Lords' changes to the policy. All 10 amendments, which included allowing courts to question Rwanda's safety, were overturned. It comes after the government insisted the country is safe, despite the Supreme Court previously ruling that the plan is unlawful. Well, former Home Office advisor Claire Pearsall's told Talk TV some of the changes the laws wanted were just common sense. One of which was looking at um, those coming from Afghanistan who had fought for the United Kingdom. And they wanted some kind of safeguard that they wouldn't get sent to Rwanda, that we would honour our um, legal obligation to them to resettle them. And the House of Commons just went, no. The owners of Marmite, Unilever, have announced plans to cut 7,500 jobs across its global operations. The UK-based firm will be moving its ice cream unit, which is home to popular brands such as Magnum and Ben & Jerry's, into a standalone business. The company employs around 128,000 staff and says many of the losses will be office-based roles. A new report out today is warning that roads in England and Wales are at breaking point with the pothole repairs at an eight-year high. The annual alarm survey found that local councils were expected to fix two million potholes over the current financial year. That's a 43% increase from last year. Well, mechanic Louise Baker knows firsthand the problems they cause. I, I book up like four weeks in advance for just services and MOTs, and in that time I get at least four phone calls a week saying about um, I found this piece of metal hanging off my car, I hit a big bump, my tyre's blown out, my 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 tyre's not holding pressure. Yeah, it, it's, it's constant. Israel's agreed to send a team to Washington to discuss their planned RAFA operation after the US president warned the planned raid would be a mistake. Joe Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spoke on the phone earlier this week as tensions between the two countries grow over the war in the Middle East. 1.5 million people are displaced and sheltering in RAFA. Well, US National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says any further action in the region would only isolate Israel even more. The President and the Prime Minister spoke at length about Rafa today. The President explained why he is so deeply concerned about the prospect of Israel conducting major military operations in Rafa of the kind it conducted in Gaza City and Khan Yunus. On the call today, President Biden asked the Prime Minister to send a senior interagency team composed of military, intelligence and humanitarian officials. The weapons armourer for the film Rust, who was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter earlier this month, has asked for a new trial. Hannah Gutierrez-Reed was found guilty in connection with the fatal shooting of cinematographer Helena Hutchins in 2021, which happened on set. She's asked for a fresh hearing and to be released from prison in the meantime. 
And a smiling Princess of Wales has been seen in video footage for the first time since her abdominal surgery following weeks of speculation about her health. The Sun's published a clip of Kate out with Prince William in Windsor at a farm shop over the weekend. The couple have faced weeks of social media speculation following the photo editing row. She's not carried out public duties since Christmas. That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. Overall, it's looking mostly fine and dry across the vast majority of the UK for this afternoon, but there will be some showers about, mainly across parts of the Midlands, central, southern and eastern England. Some of them could be heavy and thundery. And a few passing showers across Scotland. Otherwise, a lot of dry and bright weather. And in the sunshine, and with the winds becoming lighter later, it will feel pleasantly mild temperatures up to around 15 or 16 degrees Celsius. But before the end of the day, there will be rain across parts of Ireland and the southwest of England and Wales. That will steadily move its way northeastwards overnight across uh, many parts there will be heavy downpours particularly across the high ground of Wales later over towards the Pennines and parts of Ireland and Northern Ireland that rain will also border into southern Scotland by dawn. Across southern areas it will become drier by the early hours of the morning it will be mild for most places but over Scotland central and northern parts will be clear and chilly with a patchy frost through tomorrow that rain lingers really across parts of southern Scotland Northern England and there will be further pulses of rain across parts of Wales with heavy downpours again the rest of England and Wales mostly fine and bright and still mild further north and west across Scotland and Northern Ireland it will also be sunny but feeling cooler Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer and you are with Talk TV. Lots to talk about today at home and abroad. And joining me to run through all the biggest stories is editor of Spiked Online, Tom Slater. Uh, good morning good to morning. you. Um, I've seen you more recently than the last show. Did the Spiked Online uh, 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 what's, uh, what's, 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 what am I talking about um, podcast last mm -hmm. week? Great fun as well. Thank really you very good much, to, Really good to see you. No, no, absolute pleasure. Thank you for coming on the show. Uh, do, I do encourage you. It is one I listen to every week. Annoyingly, can't listen to it when it's me, for obvious <laughs> reasons, because that would be weird. Right, uh, lots to talk about. Um, big speech today by Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor. And we're going to spend all three hours talking about mm. that, so tune off now. No, don't worry, we're not doing that. But a big speech from her. Um, not going to be any actual economic announcements. It's going to be about just, you know, it's a, I think it's going to be a vision thing mm. and about change and hope. And apparently the Labour Party are facing a sort of 1979 level sort of you know, levels of change they need to bring about. Um, what do you uh, what do you think Labour will do? Well, of course, I've been thinking about it non-stop, like half of the nation. <laughs> in the pub last night, Terrible. no one was talking about anything else. I mean, so, it's all so, everyone's talking about. We'll keep this bit of the conversation really short, don't worry. <laughs> but it is, it's a vision speech from an individual in a party without much vision, really. I yeah. mean, we know roughly what it is that their sort of prognosis is. There's this sense of we need to clear up the mess from the Tories and what we need to do is have radical change, but within very tight, Boundaries. You know, we want all this investment, but the plan is, you know, you change the planning laws and you just hope and pray that, like, you can do a rain dance and that the private sector investment will just flood in. Um, so it's not necessary that this is going to be something which is going to set pulses racing or no. anything. That's almost the opposite of what this Labour Party is trying to do. They don't want to frighten the horses. Um, we are in sort of like John Smith, uh, the late John Smith territory, Gordon Brown territory's Chancellor as well, just Shadow Chancellor before 97. Does mm -hmm. that sort of steady as she goes, bank managerial sort of attitude. Mm -hmm. But that said, I mean, given the state of the economy under the Tory party, but again, largely due to a lot of policies which Labour supported, mm -hmm. like uh, furlough schemes Absolutely. and lockdowns and things, um, you know, the economy needs some... Well, I think it's, does it need TLC or does it need a kick up the backside? Well, that is, the, as you were suggesting, so that's the big contrast with 1997. There's all kinds of contrast with 1997, not least the relative charisma of the two Labour leaders then and now. But there was also the fact that they were moving into, relatively speaking, a kind of economic boom time where you yeah. could have an incoming Labour government that could splash the cash. Yeah, I mean, there was all the, the oil revenues, the, 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 the finances were in a very, very good state indeed. Um, thanks to, you know, Nigel Lawson's and everybody. Um, things are not in a good state. I, I do sort of wonder whether actually, if you're the uh, leader of the Labour Party and Shadow Chancellor, although you're desperate to get into Downing Street, is this really the year you want to mm. do it? Because I think people's expectations, who are big Labour supporters, are going to be sorely, sorely smashed 
within a few weeks. Absolutely. I suppose the question then becomes how humbling is the defeat for the Tories? How long will it take them to yeah. recover? Will they almost get you know, a decade in power by default because of how disastrous the election result is? Yeah. That's the sort of thing that could buy them a bit more time for yeah. a bit more sunlit uplands to creep in. But they're, you know, in terms of just their sort of ambitions, they're not a kind of radical incoming party. By no, the certainly not. Well, we, well we, although we shall see. Who, who knows what we end up getting. I want to ask you about this today. I've got two social questions for you today uh, and, and questions for you to call in about. This one is about Labour. Uh, we're asking about Chadwick Chancellor Rachel Reeves. She's promised a new chapter in Britain's economic history if Labour are elected. That's what we were hearing in advance of the speech she's giving this evening. Will Labour, I'm asking you today, do a better job than the Conservatives? Tell us why they will. Tell us why they won't. I would love to hear your thoughts. Do get in touch on 0344 uh, 499 1000. You can also text on 8722 or you can tweet me at talk uh, TV as well. Now, I've also got another question and that relates to the front page of this paper. That is, of course, The Sun. It's a very good column in this uh, today's paper, by the way, written by yours truly. You've got to have a look at that. But also, on the front page, Royal World exclusive, first picture. Great to see you again, Kate. Pictures of William and Kate. Now, well, from a video um, which uh, uh, was apparently taken at the weekend at a, uh, a farm shop uh, near their home in Windsor. And we can show you the video right now. Uh, sort of fairly grainy from a distance. You know, cars, as you can see, if you're watching on the telly, you can see uh, parked. Now, William apparently walking along in jeans and in a, in a jacket, wearing his uh, a baseball cap. Uh, his wife, Kate, walking along. First pictures we've seen of her moving uh, with a, a carrier bag full of her shopping. Everyone's saying, looking happy and relaxed. Now, we understand this video was, uh, you know, has been has been put out. I mean, again, it looks like it was taken by an amateur, or was it? We don't know. It's mm -hmm. been brought up by the Sun and by TMZ, um, but um, lots of people would say, well, finally, this is the photograph, this is the video to end all the speculation about the Princess of Wales's health. N numerous, numerous claims about her health and indeed her whereabouts in in recent, not just weeks and months, but certainly since that photograph on Mother's Day, uh, which is shown to be doctrine, was pulled by all of the big world's uh, news and, and picture agencies. Um, and the emergency, by the way, another photo of the late Queen with all of her great, great grandchildren. I think that also, it turns out, has been doctored. Looks like everyone's been photoshopping everything. Thing. This this image goes out there online yesterday. The I think the first sort of five million responses <laughs> were that's not Kate. Mm. Everyone was saying that's not Kate. So I want to ask you also about this new video of the Princess of Wales, which has prompted more online conspiracy theories about her health and about her whereabouts. I'd love uh, to hear from you about that as well. What should the palace do? to end speculation about Kate and her health and her whereabouts. What can they actually do to stop that? Do they have to do anything? Should they? Uh, can we just leave Kate alone? Can she just recover in peace? Or did the palace bring this on themselves by putting out that doctored photo on Mother's Day? Give us a call, 0344 499 1000, text on 8722, or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls are charged at the national rate. Text cost one, standard network rate message. So we moved on from Rachel Reeves to Kate. Mm. Tom, what was your reaction when you saw this? Well, I haven't studied it in enough detail to verify. I trust You're the royals You're not a implicitly. massive royal watch. It no. is, has to be I mean, said. people are pouring over that farm shop video like it's frames from the Zapruder film or something. Mm. I mean, it speaks to the sort of age that we live in and the sort of conspiratorial times. I mean, it's not as if that the royals haven't been caught out trying to put out images before that weren't all they were cracked up to be. We saw that the other week with this um, doctored image. But at the same time, I think the problem that they're running into is you can't help but feed conspiracy theories. Responding to them at all was a bit yeah. of a hiding to nothing. I mean, you put out, even if it was a, a... You would think that this would end speculation. It never does. It, it's just one of those things where as soon as someone or something becomes the target of one of these swirling conspiracy theories, it just it's goes, never going to stop. There's nothing I mean, you can really do of, to stop it. Short of Kate sort of appearing for live cameras before, you know, a pool, you know, press association, BBC, ITV, mm. you know, and, and standing there and saying, Look, I'm fine, but I'm not fine enough to go back to work. I'm, I, I need. I'm you still wouldn't stop. They claim it's a hologram think... or a clone or something. No, like no, that. people least, would. Yeah, no, exactly. That's the thing. <laughs> so in that case, should the palace stop? You know, not feed mm -hmm. any of this and just ignore it because there are lunatics and conspiracy theorists everywhere. Mm -hmm. I... Or, or should they try and? Well, some of it, because a lot of people like, you know, um, Arthur Edwards, who is the son's royal photographer for years, you know, knows the royal family well. I mean, they always wave hello to him, call out his name in person. Um, 
he, you know, he says, you know, people stop him all the time and ask him. I have to say, and people oh, get all these messages after the show or online saying, oh, for God's sake, why are you going on about Kate? Why are you going? Mm -hmm. That is the only subject in the last month or so that friends of mine mm. who don't have no interest in, you know, news and things, I've got in touch going, hey, what's the truth about Kate? What's the truth about King Charles and things? I mean, there was a good one conspiracy theory that, that he was dead, for goodness sake. Mm -hmm. I well, think it's it, a pretty hurtful things to people to put about online. Absolutely, and I think it's, it's a reminder that I think the royals should have stuck to their guns, really, in terms of being much more guarded about Don't let the light in. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a royalist by any stretch of the imagination, but I think that approach that they had for a long, long time, I mean, were, we didn't know the, the Queen's health until well after she died and the kind of subsequent biographies and so on yeah. about what it was that she was suffering from. I think that's something which not only does it help kind of maintain the mystique, which is actually quite important to monarchy, the sense that it's one step removed, but also, yeah it creates less space for these kinds of conspiracy theories to churn. You could argue that not saying anything creates more room for speculation. I think it's the opposite because... Yeah, I mean, she couldn't have just, just disappeared for months off. on end and no one said anything. Absolutely. But what we've had almost is um, at least two news cycles now out of this yeah. um, attempts to dispel yeah. the conspiracy theories. So that tells working. you something about how uh, you can end up feeding the beast. I, I would suggest, and again, if you're going, stop having a go. No one's having a go at Kate. <laughs> I mean, no one is like, you know, it's a woman. I'd rather we weren't talking about No, her I know you would, but also, I mean, look, you know, she's trying to recover. I've always said, you know, title to her privacy, leave mm -hmm. her, you know, that's fine. I'm not the one putting the pictures out there, or, or you know, I'm, I think this is a palace issue. I think this is a palace staff issue. Mm -hmm. I think, as I keep saying, palace flunkies have flunked yet again. Let's talk about something that um, a lot of people we know do very much care about, and that is uh, dealing with illegal migration. Uh, the Rwanda bill is supposed to deal with that. It doesn't really. It'll be a handful of people. Even Rwanda's government has said, look, it's going to be, you know, can we can we do this very slowly? Mm -hmm. But names, you know, the, the names of people who are, who are going to be selected to go on these Rwanda flights have been selected. Last night, MPs went into the lobby uh, voting uh, chambers in the, in the House of Commons uh, at 10 times to overturn 10 key Lords amendments to the Rwanda bill. So it's back in the Commons. It then goes, you know, I do said it then goes back to the Lords, but there'll be more votes uh, uh, on Wednesday as well, um, as Labour are whipping to actually have some more amendments in the Commons on the bill. This is the whole thing they call ping pong in the mm -hmm. Commons. Now we know eventually it's, it is the Commons that will win. And we know that the Tories do have a big majority. And even with the likes of, you know, the Robert Bucklands and others, uh, voting against some aspects of the measures. This is a, you know, this this is a, a, a strong conservative measure. It should get through. Do you think those flights are ever going to actually get off the ground, though? And will it make a even the tiniest bit of difference? I think that's the problem, isn't it? Because even if everything goes wonderfully to plan from here on out, at least, even if they stave off this Lord's Rebellion, even if they get their first flight off, even if they get that paltry 150 people over to that one particular... Um, currently kind of mothballed, empty hotel, hotel yeah. slash hostel that they've got out there. I won't make go the stay at a hotel in Rwanda. <laughs> Heard a lot about it. Um, it won't make the blindest bit of difference. It won't make the blindest bit of difference to the problem because as we've described, these are quite small numbers. The theory is it's going to be a deterrent, but... Yeah. But, but the small at, numbers at means rate, it's not a deterrent. It would, exactly, it would imply that it's not going to make much difference. But also in terms of electorally, we all know that even if, as I say, everything went perfectly to plan, he's not going to get any credit for this. People are rightly going to intuit that he's still not really on top of the problem. It's just taken on kind of symbolic significance. We have to get one flight off before, at least one yeah. flight off before the next election. People have seen through it, though. Even if it does happen, they know that they have failed to tackle this so far. They know that this is really scratching at the surface of the problem. They're not going to gain, reap any electrical benefit for it. No. Having gone through all of that pain and slog of getting it to yeah. that point. And also the bandwidth of government. We heard a lot about, you know, how much, the, how much the, you know, Downing Street, because the government is so centralised mm -hmm. now, how much they can actually deal with it at any one time. When all the focus has been on that, oh, and then, by the way, oh, then we're just going to put out some figures showing that, you know, legal migration is in the, you know, three quarters of a million net uh, a, a year. And people go, uh, excuse me, what, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> also bearing in mind that actually we've still got you know, tens of thousands of people coming through on lorries, smuggled in on lorries, uh, you know, uh, uh, via, via other routes than, than boats. So, you know, that's all being completely ignored as well. Um, let's talk about also things uh, further afield. Um, and the an aid coalition has issued a warning. This is uh, um, uh, a, a, a group that... Um, that they include, you know, World Food Program and the World Health Organization and others, Refugees International, as others, saying that basically we're looking at catastrophic levels of hunger in Gaza. They believe that famine is imminent, with more than a million people at risk, including, of course, children. They say that. Uh, 
uh, children and others are already dying as a result mm -hmm. of malnutrition uh, and lack of food. Um, and the situation they say is man-made starvation. Um, basically, they're not able to get any clean water, uh, enough nutrition, um, food supplies, any, any supplies people had in their store cupboards are gone. So many people have moved from the north to the south. Um, they, they, you know, they, they, they're, they're intense. They had no access to food. Um, I'm, you know, you won't find a greater supporter of, of Israel's right to self-defense and their right to root out Hamas in Gaza, and in, including their right to, uh, to to go into Rafah, where we clearly have huge numbers of Hamas tunnels uh, are still in place. Um, but there is also a duty on Israel, is there not, to make sure that innocent civilians don't starve to death. We cannot allow that to happen on our mm -hmm. watch, can we? Oh, absolutely. And whilst it's one of those issues where I don't think there's always full consideration given to the difficulty of trying to kind of square this circle where you do have a war zone, you do have a situation where you're trying to take out a, um, an enemy which they're completely within their rights to try to take out. How within that framework, given how infiltrated Hamas is into all facets of society, do you easily allow aid to get in? It's, this is something which isn't straightforward. And I think the kind of attempt to suggest that Israel is purposefully doing this almost as a kind of weapon of war is, is wide of the mark. Oh, well, um, yeah, but, but Israel's accused same, of everything. No, exactly. I mean, you know. And that's always the difficulty, isn't it? Because the, the debate often goes on the level of caricature, you often can't really drill down to what's what, what but they specifically are allowed, can be done. They are allowing to happen. Now, the, the, argument, the argument we hear from Israel, we had a representative of the Israeli government on the show last week, and I, and I grilled her about this, is that, look, there's, you know, we're not stopping aid coming in. Mm -hmm. Um, it is it is the aid agencies, you know, it's Egypt, some other countries are not getting the aid in, and it is Hamas fighters who are stealing the mm -hmm. aid, or it's the threat to those aid trucks that is the problem. We've seen some airlifts, again, laughable, just you know, tens of thousands yeah. of, 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 of food for tens of thousands of people when you've got you know millions of people needing food. Um, even building this uh, this this sort of mini port, uh, this mm -hmm. this uh, to, to actually bring in aid from the seas doesn't seem to me to to be to be working. They need huge numbers of trucks full of food to be going in every single day. Now, that, that clearly is possible, um, except we do know that Hamas fighters, you know, it's what they've always done, will mm -hmm. be stealing the day. Is that something that Israel are simply going to have to accept that, that is going to, a, a certain amount of this aid is going to be stolen by Hamas? Mm -hmm. And that's just part of, that's just part of the, the vagaries of war. Or is it the case, actually, you know, that that Hamas are deliberately stealing this food because they want, as they've been happy to do in terms of using their civilian population as human shields, they actually are quite happy for people to mm -hmm. starve to death because the images go around the world, Israel is blamed, and, um, and, 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 and then that, that, and Hamas has their work done for them in the PR front. I, th I think that's really important. I think any assessment of how Israel goes from here always has to be prefaced with that with that point, which is to say that they're up against an enemy which is very willing to sacrifice their own civilians, very will willing to put them in harm's way. Eager to, all Exactly. The propaganda win is, is, more, is more important to them than those people's lives. So whatever criticism that we should level at the Israeli government for its handling of this particular crisis, we, we, I think it's important that we bear that context in mind because it adds this incredible mm. layer of complexity to anything that it is. That Indeed. Um, I also uh, want to talk about um, Donald Trump. Um, he, uh, in that New York fraud case where mm. he's basically found he and his sons and his, his business, Trump organization found to have basically overplayed uh, how much their, their properties and uh, their businesses were worth to get cheaper loan deals. Um, and of course, they, they, they underplay them when it comes to tax. So he's a, uh, uh, he's uh, uh, facing a bond of $464 million while he appeals. So the deal in America is he, he has to pay the, the money that is the fine. He has to pay that money and while the appeal is going ahead so that if he loses the appeal, that money is already paid. Um, he can't get hold of that money. He's gone to numerous uh, loan uh, organisations and banks. They will not lend him that money, his lawyers say. What mm -hmm. do you make of that? Well, it's just a reminder of how when... If you're someone who's so kind of in the sights of all of official, all of the law or whatever as Donald Trump is. He has sort of been declared kind of public enemy number one by various elements of the establishment. Some of these cases, of course, are real and genuine. Some yeah. of them are sort of trumped up and political. He's someone who's a lot easier to attack because there are quite a few dodgy dealings that he's been engaged with over the years. But if you're in a situation where that per person becomes so untouchable that they can't even properly defend themselves, yeah. that does become a big issue. And also with all of these cases, this one is a bit of a reminder. There's such a wide array of them. They started off with saying he's a threat to democracy. Yeah. You know, he's like a, a orange Mussolini and he needs to be taken out. And now it's he tried to sell flats by claiming that the study was actually a third bedroom. It's yeah. something like this where you kind of realise there is a, there is genuinely a kind of get Trump 
Oh, there's no, no doubt at all. I, I also think that the he's probably banged to rights on most of these ones. But I'm wondering whether this has, has any sort of analogies with, uh, um, you know, with, with Nigel Farage, unable to get, you know, I mean, being, you know, thrown out by his bank <laughs> at the time, you know, by Coots. Um, and, and, and whether this is it. That's, we know that Donald Trump for years wasn't able to get loans in America. He had to go to Russia, mm -hmm. which is what starts all those Russian conspiracy theories. Um, uh, because because no one would lend him because they they knew it was kind of a house of cards and mm -hmm. he, in, and he's not a very good businessman it turns mm -hmm. out I mean basically I, I always love the stat that you know, if the money he'd inherited from his father been given from his father early on if he just put that on the you know on on the, the New York Stock Exchange mm -hmm. over all those years he'd have more money now than he's got that man has managed to basically squander. A, a fortune, which is quite a, quite a feat. Just finally, I want to ask you, most important story of the day, of course, not the photograph of Kate, no, no, photograph of the new James Bond. It turns out, ladies, if you're paying attention, uh, the name's Johnson, Taylor Johnson. British actor Aaron Taylor Johnson has been formally offered the opportunity uh, to play James Bond putting an end to months of speculation regarding who will succeed Daniel Craig in the role. Um, uh, generally talking to the ladies in the office, gents feel free to give an opinion, including your good self, Tom. <laughs> we have very big issues with the long hair. Mm. We are not... Nothing wrong with that, chaps. We're not convinced that James Bond has long hair. I'm assuming it'll be cut. Presumably. I mean, they can't... You know, I get that they want to reinvent the formula and stuff, but him walking around yeah. like that wouldn't really work. It's like reinventing it as a woman. No, I mean, I'm, 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 I always wanted Idris. Idris Elba, mm. he'd be a super Why didn't that one. happen? You felt like that would have been such a... Like, everyone was I mean, up for that, it, apart from a few racist idiots on the internet. Yes, ones. exactly. But I think it would have pleased everyone. I think, yeah, and, and he could have been, you know, he could have been the, the very posh, you know, James mm -hmm. Bond, you know, wanted to say public school sort of thing, yeah. What, what do you reckon? Well, Aaron Taylor Jones. I, haven't, I don't think I've seen him in anything. It's a bit hard to, to judge. I was slightly alarmed by the fact that he's only about a year older than me, so I'm going to be confronted with the fact in not too, in not oh. too long distance. I was, I was quite, he's 33. Me. I was quite encouraged by the fact that, that apparently his wife is 56, so uh, hope for me, yes. <laughs> hope for me, yes. I could marry a Bond. Yay. Anyway, today, let's uh, talk about uh, the question I'm asking you today. Uh, Chancellor, so apologies, Shadow Chancellor, possibly future Chancellor, Rachel Rees, has uh, promised in a speech she's making tonight that a new chapter in Britain's economic history it will unfold if Labour are elected. She promised a 1979 moment. I want to know, will Labour do a better job than the Conservatives? Tell us why they will. Tell us why they won't. Robert says, you'd be tempted to say they could hardly do a worse job than the Conservatives, but they'd find a way. And Russell says, it will be a new chapter. We'll be even worse off. Uh, we're also asking you about that new video and uh, image of the Princess of Wales, which has prompted yet more online conspiracy theories about her health. What should the palace do to end the speculation? And Sally says simply, tell the truth. That's all people require. That implies they're not telling the truth now. Mm. Tell us more, Sally. Uh, coming up after the break, MPs have rejected all 10 of the House of Lords amendments to the government's Rwanda bill. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie, right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested 
alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Okay. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just yeah. you for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're yeah, supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley Brew. You are with Talk TV. Now, MPs last night rejected all 10 of the House of Lords amendments to the government's Rwanda bill. But ministers insist flights could still take off with channel migrants to the African nation within months. Uh, they are facing more amendments from the Commons on Wednesday. Joining me right now is Conservative peer and polling expert Lord Hayward. Uh, good uh, morning to you, Robert. Good morning. Thank How are you? Thank you very well indeed. I want to talk to you about your polling side of things in a moment, but... It wasn't right. really a surprise, was it, that uh, when this bill got ping-ponged back to the House of Commons, those 10 amendments that were brought in by not just actually the Labour and Lib Dem and Crossbench peers, but actually quite a few Tory peers as well, that they would be rejected by uh, the Commons with a Tory majority still around the 60 mark. Um, but what, tell us what actually happens now. Well, those votes mean that the bill now comes back to the Lords we have uh, debates and a vote or series of votes tomorrow. So uh, it is likely that um, the Lords will restate their position. But ultimately, however many times the ping pong occurs, um, it, the view is, quite rightly, that the elected House has the final say. Yeah. And therefore, the Le Lords will concede in some form or another. But Labour have said that they're going to whip their peers to to vote, uh, you know, uh, you know, across the across the board on these amendments again. But even if they do, because the Tories don't have a majority uh, in uh, in in the House of Lords, do you think it's likely that it, it literally the same bills come back again, or, or do you think some of them will fall by the wayside? I think some will fall by the wayside. There will be discussions to see if there are any room, if there is any room for compromise. But at the end of the day, uh, it is likely, as you said, the Conservatives don't have a majority in the Lords. No one group has a majority in the Lords. Uh, and therefore, what will happen is that a combination of crossbenches, Lib Dems, Labour, possibly some Tory peers, will reinstate some of those amendments and it'll go back to the Commons. And as I say, ultimately, it will be for the Commons to decide and one of the things we have to bear in mind, Labour thinking that it might be in government in the near future, won't want to protract the debates in the Lords because it would set a precedent yeah. if the Labour Party as a government were then introducing its own legislation. It would be in a position whereby ah. the other parties, the Lib Dems, Crossbenchers and the Conservatives could say, ah, but when it came to the Rwanda bill, you opposed or imposed amendments yet again two, three, four times, uh, and they would face the same. And they could do the same. Well, I mean, the government has, accused, uh, has said these are wrecking amendments, and they, of course they include you know, attempts to water down the legislation um, uh, and uh, you know prevent legal, which is designed to prevent legal challenges, scuppering future deportation flights. Um, so it's going to go ping pong, ping pong. We've already seen from the Commons leader Penny Mordaunt that uh, they choose it, allotting very small, smaller and smaller amounts of time in the Commons to deal with this, making it really clear, look, we want to get this through. Could be get, got through, I, in, in the best case scenario for the government, before Easter. Um, 
Best case scenario for getting those flights off the ground. Um, we're told it's sometime in spring, but we're also told that apparently that goes all the way to mid-June uh, for, for the government. I think most of us will think we're, we're well into summer at that point. Um, but there is a, you know, there's a possibility of those flights absolutely, you know, taking off within, you know, within the foreseeable future. There is a complication because once the bill is uh, becomes law and it's an act, uh, there is still the question of legal challenges in one form or another, and I'm sure that will happen. Yeah. I was smiling when you were talking about spring going right through to the middle of June. I remember when I was in government in the department many years ago, uh, we had a discussion as to what constituted autumn and winter. <laughs> and uh, yes. How the long winter the... nights must fly by in <laughs> government. This is what they spend their time I, doing. It's... Well, we understand um, from the Times that the Home Office has already identified 150 migrants out of the 5,641 eligible for removal who will be the first ones to be sent. Um, um, and they reckon they're the ones who pose the least risk of being able to mount a successful legal challenge. But even if it's not a successful legal challenge, it can still be an unsuccessful, very long-winded legal challenge. And that's the issue, isn't it? That's the fear that the government obviously has. But having said that, although, and you were discussing earlier on, the, the impact of the, the numbers involved, it has become uh, emblematic of the government's determination to tackle illegal immigration. So getting a few people there, and that's why the significance of the flights which you asked about is so important. And there could be legal challenges, but at that point the government has, will be saying, we've done what we can, support us, because we are determined to enforce this policy. Yeah, well, we shall see again whether it actually achieves anything. Um, look, you're a pollster as well as a Conservative peer. Does getting people on those flights, even if it's half a dozen or 150 or even if it's 3,000, does that actually do anything, do you think, to change the poll ratings for the Conservatives, given the doldrums are in right now? In itself, no. But what it does do is change slightly an attitude because... Rishi can say, as he can show with Northern Ireland, can he show with the economy, look, I'm getting things done, I am pursuing these matters, and therefore it's, it's not in itself something that immediately affects the polls, but it affects people's perception of what the government can or can't achieve. Um, in terms of what the government can or can't achieve, is there in any... Is it, in all of your expertise as a bolster, any chance whatsoever of the Conservatives winning the next general election under Rishi Sunak's leadership? And, and, and is, there, is there a greater chance if another politician was in charge? There is absolutely no chance that a change in leadership would actually change the Conservative prospect. The public at large has taken a long time to get over the events of 2021, 2022, quite rightly. And for the Tory party to then turn around in 2024 and say, you're going to change the leader, um, the public, would the response would be, oh, well, you're having a laugh. Um, not only would the public in Britain take that view, but the worldwide public would take that view. If the poll ratings of a pr leader are markedly worse than of the party, there is a case for changing the leader. But the poll ratings of the Conservative Party are broadly the same as the poll ratings for the leader. And therefore, there's no benefit in changing. And there is a dramatic downside to it. What do you make of all the shenanigans we've seen in the papers over the last few days about a possible stalking horse candidate? You know, Penny Morden has been to uh, you know, touted as a candidate that even being put up by the right, even though she's very much seen as a on the One Nation side of things. Um, and, you know, she's she's been conspicuously silent. Her camp apparently are blaming either right wingers for putting her up, uh, the Downing Street for for stirring things. I mean, what right wingers apparently can't unite around their own candidate? What what do you make of what is going on? much exaggerated. Um, th there is a group of people who, as you just said, uh, on one section, a very small section, who can't agree on what they actually want to do. So they're casting around one person after another, one plot after another. But it's a very, very small group of people. Uh, and as I say, actually, the stories are much exaggerated. 
Penny Mordaunt's made her comment. She's described it as nonsense. Uh, and uh, the, the sooner the party can move on um, and these small, this small group can concentrate on other matters, the better for the Tory party because they're damaging, they, that small group, are damaging the prospects uh, of all the MPs. Even more than there already are. Lord Hayward, thank you so much, Robert. Thank appreciate you. your time. Tom Slater is still with me. Your thoughts on that? I think it just sums up what I thought for some time that it's, it's not just that the Tory party can't win the next election with Rishi Sunak as leader, although that's almost certainly true. They can't win the next election with anyone as leader, really. I think the damage is already done. They've so spectacularly ruined that kind of inheritance that Brexit in 2019 gave them. And really, in terms of casting around for different characters now, even if you found someone who would make a lot of sense, you might be able to reassemble that coalition. It's just not the right time. It feels like they're, go they're going to... The mood in the public is such that they're going to need to spell an opposition before they can even rebuild Even that though there actually it appears in the polls not to be much enthusiasm for Labour, mm -hmm. it's just sort of, look, well, you've had your go, Tories. We're going to try Labour, even though a lot of people don't seem to think they rate particularly Keir Starmer or indeed Labour's chances. Well, today we're going to hear a little bit more about what Labour would do if they do win the next general election. Uh, Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves is promising a new chapter in Britain's economic history if Labour are elected. So I want to ask you about that. Will Labour, do you think, do a better job than the Conservatives? Tell us why you think they will. Tell us why you think they won't. Uh, tell us why. Give us a call on 0344 499 1000, text on 8722. We can get in touch on X at Talk TV. Uh, John says, nope, they're too interested in woke left wing issues rather than getting on with sorting real issues. Rob says, I see very little difference between both parties these days. I wouldn't trust either of them to serve anyone but themselves. I'm also asking you this morning about this new video, new images of the Princess of Wales, which has prompted yet more online conspiracy theories about her health. I want to know, what should the palace do to end all the speculation? Alfred says, release an actual photo of her. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's even more. Everyone's going, that's not a photo of Kate. What do they have to do? Uh, coming up after the break. I'd love to hear from you, by the way. Get on the phones. You're very quiet today. 0344 499 1000. If there's anything you want to talk about, if you don't want to talk about Kate, you don't want to talk about a speech you haven't yet heard, I accept that. Talk about the Rwanda bill. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Do you think the Rwanda bill, even if it goes through, is actually going to make a difference to uh, Tory poll chances? Uh, give us a call. 0344 499 1000. Uh, coming up. We're going to talk more about speculation about, well, all of the royals. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on mm. the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. 
Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you are with Talk TV. Now, after much online speculation about her health, a video and images of the Princess of Wales outside a farm shop in Windsor has finally emerged. It's on the front page of today's Sun newspaper. Uh, it's also a video we're showing you right now if you're just watching on the telly. Great to see you again, Kate. Is the Sun front page the Royal World exclusive first picture? This after. I mean, weeks and weeks and weeks of online speculation, which got into fever pitch territory after that Mother's Day photo apparently taken by Prince William uh, was uh, shown by to be well, pretty doctored. I mean, I think there were about 10 different bits that were, had been doctored and photoshopped in a very, very poor fashion uh, by, it would appear, Kate, although I'd like to point out again, in that statement apologising, she never actually said she had actually photoshopped that particular photograph. Another photograph, actually, of the Queen uh, with her many... late Queen with her many uh, great-grandchildren uh, has also now been shown to have had changes made as well. Well, let's talk about this and all these conspiracy theories online with Angela Levin, who's a royal biographer. Angela, thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. Thank you. I mean, OK, first of all, what do you make of the online speculation that has got to fever pitch about Kate's health? Where is she? Is she in a fit state? What's happened? I mean, questions about her health, questions about where she is, questions about even the state of the, the couple's marriage. Um, this, this video emerges. These images are in the newspapers. They're online. As far as I can see, the reaction has been almost unanimously, that's not Kate. So the conspiracy theory seems to have... Seem to have just basically been sort of, you know, so, you know, given an extra sort of rocket load of, uh, of fuel. What do you make of it all? Well, what I make of it is that there's a certain type of person now who you can't actually have a discussion with or offer a different view. Once they've made up their view, that's it, no matter what. And I think a large um, portion of people who've made these allegations are those sort of people. So um, even if she was standing there talking to them, they yeah. wouldn't take any notice. They won't change their mind. We've seen this over across a huge and many diff huge different things in this country now. And I think that um, it's not necessarily up to the palace to do things. It's up to making people leave their name, address and contact details if they want to join anything. So you can trace back who they are and what they're doing, because I think it's getting dangerous. There's obviously a thread, more than a thread, there's obviously a desire to get rid of the royal family and certainly to get rid of um, the heirs to the royal family. Oh, so you, you very, think very there's popular. something more sinister going on? It's not just sort of people sitting in their sinister. kitchens. Make, you think there's actually a conspiracy? Otherwise. I mean, you, you mentioned the Queen's picture. I was going to do that absolutely as well. Nobody said a word at the time. Nobody could care less. So why do they care now? I mean, this is an, it's an attitude of people. And I think it's very dangerous. And something has to be done um, very fast and very firmly that um, stops people who we don't know makes all this nonsense. And if you hear endless negative, it affects you as well. I found myself looking more carefully than I would have done normally. And well, no, no, that's speaks. not necessarily a bad thing. Because, look, I mean, when, look, whenever we have these conversations, whenever I tweet anything about this or we talk about it on air, I get two main reactions. One is, oh, God, why are you talking about this nonsense? Which is a fair point for people who are listening. We often you know, we basically cover politics and current affairs here. 
um, on my show, um, all they say, leave Kate alone. Now, no one's attacking Kate. You're not attacking her. I'm not. I think the conspiracy theory, uh, theorists certainly are. But there is an issue of trust that has been raised. There is an issue also in terms of absolutely incompetent flunkies at the palace who have failed in their job, either in advising or what they have chosen to put out on behalf of the palace. And there is an issue of... You know, once you once you put William and Kate out as the most popular members of the royal family, more popular than the King and Camilla, you know, they're very, very popular figures, who have to say, all credit to Kate, she knew the deal, she married into the family, she's done exactly what the job involves, she's, you know, she's married, she doesn't complain, she turns up to everything, she looks nice, she's turned out three apparently lovely kids, all credit to her, she knew the deal, she doesn't, she's not a Megan, she doesn't whinge about everything every five minutes, but... Here's the thing. If she's on the front pages every single day and then suddenly she's not and people go, oh, OK, but you said she'd be out for a few months, but hold on a minute, what's really going on? That was always going to happen. Why did the palace, which has very highly paid, very experienced PR people, why didn't they see this coming, head it off at the pass and handle all of this much better? Well, two reasons. One is that there's been a big change of the people who do look after uh, Catherine and William, and um, they're not really settled in. That's number one. Oh, come on. I mean, when did they start? Last Monday? No, it was about um, a month or two ago. I'm sorry, if you, if you take a month it's or two to time. settle in in a job like that, then you shouldn't have been hired. You're no good at your job. Well, that's a different question, isn't it? Nobody would have expected that. And I think they felt, as they said, not until after, after Easter, any of us who know when Easter comes will realise it's not here yet. Yeah. And they're waiting. And I think that it's not fair to expect them to pour out exactly what has been wrong with Catherine. No, exactly. And one of the reasons, one of the reasons, one of the reasons is that she's got these three lovely children. We don't know how much they know about their mother. And if you put and make that into all the papers, and then there's going to be thousands of people who are mm -hmm. going to tell them what to do, who to yeah. go and see, they don't believe in it, all that. Yeah. But really, you don't want your children to know yeah, that. Yeah, no, exactly. And I I absolutely defend the right of any member of the royal family to keep their health issues private. Everyone should have that right. And, and it's speculation. Again, I find it extraordinary. People call themselves royal fans and then demand to know the most intimate details from these people's lives. They're, they're not, you're not a fan if that's what you're doing. I, I say, I get accused of having a go. Never criticise them. <laughs> I'm just, I just, leave the woman alone. But I didn't put these photos out there. But look, let me, as you said, you know, there was also this picture that people had speculation about, uh, the one that, of the late Queen with all of her, uh, the, the, the youngsters in the royal family. There was also um, a conspiracy theory put out uh, by the Russian media claiming that King Charles is dead. Well, he's actually been seen in photographs very recently, yes. with, you know, in videos, with Rishi Sudak, for goodness sake. Yes. Well, I think that was a tip for tat because yeah. the UK has actually not really believed that he's had a straightforward, honourable win to remain president. They'll actually try and do a nasty thing on us and um, show that, you know, anything you can do, we can do better. I think that's what it is. And it will also or it could have done, have made all um, lots of our things go down in the drain about what, what they're worth and um, how, the money, the, the change of money and all those sorts of things. I think it's just a nasty little trick, but it's a horrible trick because you don't want to even read that or even no. think about it. No, ex exactly. Um, the fact that, the, you know, the British Embassy in Moscow actually had to, you know, issue a statement yeah. saying the king is not dead. Quite absurd. Let's talk about two other royals who we've often spoken about in the past. You, of course, wrote a biography of uh, uh, Prince Harry and got to know him rather well during that writing. Um, but Harry and Meghan have been downgraded on the official Buckingham Palace website. The Sussex's 4,000-word individual profiles have vanished entirely. They've been replaced with just a joint section about them, uh, only 500 words, alongside Prince Andrew. I mean, ouch, that's... Well, um... it's not ouch. It's there with people who are no longer part of the royal family. They've stepped back. That's what they've but done. They, but they it's did that. They did that a couple time. of years ago. It's yeah, but it's taken them a jolly long time to do that. I don't know why they say that it's not on a priority, but actually it is to let everybody know what it is. Um, and I, and I think that's right. I I also imagine that it's come after the, the new website where they've taken back almost royal. Um, names and um they they really want to come to london and 
do all the things that they used to do for us. No, they don't. They just want to gather um, popularity so that they can sell the goods, especially Megan. She wants to sell her her jam and her um, tablecloth. Can, can you remember like the name that. of her website? Because it's, it's three completely random words, isn't it? Yes. American... <laughs> so, you see, I know it's got orchard at the end. Tom, I'm sure Tom yeah. Slater's here. I'm sure you. I'm sure you know this, don't you? I've drawn a complete blank. Exactly. I mean, it's it's quite orchard. the most. Orchard. Yes, that's it. Something orchard. Yes, but again, it's just the most. It's just the most of like we just pick three words randomly. They sound nice. Let's have that on a website. This is the thing. Yeah. Look, if you are a working royal, you can't be selling these sort of goods. You think, well, hold on a minute. Oh. Doesn't doesn't King Charles when he was Prince Charles? I mean, didn't he? I have to say some very very nice um, I tried, tarts. And, I tried to work out whether I could use the first letter of each word and try and make it a word that said something, but I gave up. It's no, impossible. okay, well, well, well I, 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 I'm and actually, I'm waiting for someone. American Riviera Orchard. That's it. I mean, genuinely. Yeah. Shot, I mean, tragically, tragically bad for that. But listen, you know, they're selling, they want to sell stuff and, and, and everyone's going, oh, it's all very tacky, it's all very tacky, selling jam and, and, and things like that. But, but, but King Charles, when he was, you know, the, 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 Duke, you know the, the Prince of Wales, you know, the Duchy of Cornwall sell, still sells, you know, a huge number of, of, of goods. Is there any different? No, 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 yes, it's a huge difference because that always went to different charities. He didn't have any of that money. People like souvenirs of the royal family. Um, um, and I think that's perfectly allowed. But this is all going to go into uh, Meghan's pocket. That's a very different way. Um, and the, the, it's actually all about her doing it. These, the ones that the, um, King Charles has, had done were discussed and the cover, was, you know, the, the shape of it was all working to a... Um, uh, you know, with everybody else, does they had the sort of picture yeah, on the... I, I do the, wonder, though, uh, anything Megan does, we criticise. If the others do it, we don't. But we'll have to leave it there, Angela no, Levin. Thank you. I'm no. going to have to leave it. I'm so sorry. Time's against us. Angela, always a pleasure to have you join us. Thank you. Tom said, I know you feel strongly about all of this. I do, but I was thinking about, <laughs> I was thinking about he Kate. Really doesn't. I was thinking about Kate and what we're going to... You know, what could the Royals possibly do to try and dispel rumours, bring her back into the fold? I think they should look back into their history for inspiration. I've got four words for you. It's a Royal knockout. You put her on yes. horseback, being pelted with fake hams by Gary Lineker just dressed as a giant vegetable. You've nailed What's it. not to like? You've nailed it. We would, we would watch that. We would watch that. I want to know, what can the Palace do? Get in touch. 0344-499-1000 is the number to call. Coming up in the next hour, uh, J.K. Rowling has labelled the SNP's controversial new hate crime law as the mother of all April Fool's jokes. And Britain's roads are at breaking point thanks to potholes. Uh, both of those stories coming up. Plenty more besides. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, absolutely. It was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good morning and welcome to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Coming up in this hour, MPs have rejected all 10 of the House of Lords amendments to the government's Rwanda bill, but ministers insist flights could still take off within months. And author J.K. Rowling has labelled the SNP's controversial new hate crime law as the mother of all April Fool's jokes. She says she will continue to call a man a man amid fears that the new law, which comes into force on April the 1st, will be used against women campaigning for single-sex rights and protections. And Brins roads are at breaking point thanks to potholes, with the pothole repair bill now standing at a whopping £16 billion nationwide as heavier electric cars and larger vehicles are making the problem worse. Meanwhile, councils are launching yet another war on motorists with more fines than ever. Oh, the joys of being a motorist. We'll talk about all of that, plenty more besides. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Elliot Golkin. Good morning. The controversial Rwanda bill has suffered another setback after MPs rejected the House of Lords' changes to the policy. All ten amendments, which included allowing courts to question Rwanda's safety, were overturned. It comes after the government insisted the country is safe, despite the Supreme Court previously ruling it is not. Former Home Office adviser Claire Pearsall told Talk TV some of the changes the Lords wanted were just common sense. One of which was looking at um, those coming from Afghanistan who had fought for the United Kingdom. And they wanted some kind of safeguard that they wouldn't get sent to Rwanda, that we would honour our um, legal obligation to them to resettle them. And the House of Commons just went, no. Marmite owner Unilever has announced plans to cut 7,500 jobs across its global operations. The UK-based firm also said it planned to spin off its ice cream unit, which is home to popular brands such as Magnum, Walls and Ben & Jerry's. The company employs around 128,000 staff. Most of the job losses will be office-based. A new report out today is warning that roads in England and Wales are at breaking point with pothole repairs at an eight-year high. The annual alarm survey found that local councils were expected to fix two million potholes in the current financial year. That's a 43% jump from last year. These people in Chesterfield told Talk TV they're a daily nuisance. Every road you, you drive down, pothole, pothole, pothole after pothole, it's awful. Pretty sure the track in my car is gone. Just a genuine nightmare. There's like every single road has got potholes on. They're tyre eaters, they're alloy wheel killers. Yeah, I had a flat tyre last week. From the pole? Yeah, from the poles, yeah. Reported it multiple times to the council and they've just done nothing. Uh, my family have tried reporting it and they, you just can't get through. Israel has agreed to send a team to Washington to discuss its planned Rafa operation after the US president warned a ground invasion would be a mistake. Joe Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spoke on the phone on Monday as tensions between the two countries grow over the war in Gaza. One and a half million people are sheltering in Rafa. US National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says any further action in Gaza would isolate Israel even more. 
President and the Prime Minister spoke at length about Rafah today. The President explained why he is so deeply concerned about the prospect of Israel conducting major military operations in Rafah of the kind it conducted in Gaza City and Khan Yunus. On the call today, President Biden asked the Prime Minister to send a senior interagency team composed of military, intelligence, and humanitarian officials. The weapons armorer for the film Rust, who was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter earlier this month, has asked for a new trial. Hannah Gutierrez-Reed was found guilty in connection with the fatal shooting of cinematographer Helena Hutchins in 2021, which happened on set. She's asked for a fresh hearing and to be released from prison in the meantime. And a smiling Princess of Wales has been seen in video footage for the first time since her abdominal surgery, following weeks of speculation about her health. The Sun has published a clip of Kate out with Prince William in Windsor at a farm shop over the weekend. The couple have faced weeks of social media rumours following the photo editing row. She's not carried out public duties since Christmas. That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. Overall, it's looking mostly fine and dry across the vast majority of the UK for this afternoon, but there will be some showers about, mainly across parts of the Midlands, central, southern and eastern England. Some of them could be heavy and thundery. And a few passing showers across Scotland. Otherwise, a lot of dry and bright weather. And in the sunshine, and with the winds becoming lighter later, it will feel pleasantly mild temperatures up to around 15 or 16 degrees Celsius. But before the end of the day, there will be rain across parts of Ireland and the southwest of England and Wales. That will steadily move its way northeastwards overnight across uh, many parts there will be heavy downpours particularly across the high ground of Wales later over towards the Pennines and parts of Ireland and Northern Ireland that rain will also border into southern Scotland by dawn across southern areas it will become drier by the early hours of the morning it will be mild for most places but over Scotland central and northern parts will be clear and chilly with a patchy frost through tomorrow that rain lingers really across parts of southern Scotland northern England and there will be further pulses of rain across parts of Wales with heavy downpours again the rest of England and Wales mostly fine and bright and still mild further north and west across Scotland and Northern Ireland it will also be sunny but feeling cooler Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley Brewer, and you are with Talk TV. Uh, still with me going through all of the biggest stories of the day is Tom Slater, editor of Spiked Online. Uh, we're desperately trying to get footage of it's a knockout for mm. you as your, your theory, your theory, to, you just tuned in, um, all the conspiracy theories about Kate and photographs and, you know, the Sun front page newspaper today. Great to see you again, Kate. Uh, Royal uh, World Exclusives first picture, um, which uh, we've been greeted by people going, that's not Kate Morgan. <laughs> so he hasn't, no, nothing is going to get rid of these conspiracy theories. Your theory is, though, mm -hmm. how, we, how they end the conspiracy theories about where Kate is and her health, and et cetera, et cetera. What is your theory? I think they've got to revisit It's a Royal Knockout. I think back in 1987, people laughed at it. Ed was brainchild that he thought the way to get people to reconnect with the monarchy is to get them dressed in gold tunics on horseback, being chased <laughs> around by meatloaf or whatever it was. Let's ring up, you know, let's dig up Les Dawson and get it going. I think it's the way to do it, um, and I'm surprised no one suggested it. I, I think we're all surprised no one suggested it. Um, this is why Tom Slater is here in the studio and he's not working at Buckingham or Kensington <laughs> Palace uh, as, as a palace bunking. But there we are. You probably knew that already. Anyway, uh, let's talk about what is happening later on this evening, because it's what everybody is talking about, is it not? There's a speech tonight by the Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Reeves, uh, in a speech that she's going to talk about how, when, if Labour get in, it's going to be a 1979 moment, echoes of Margaret Thatcher taking over. Uh, kind of a bit of a turn about base. It's certainly, as you were saying earlier, a 1997 moment when there's loads of money in the bank and everything's fine. Uh, Britain is in the doldrums economically, huge debts, lots of things going wrong. But she has promised, well, she will promise in her speech, a new chapter in Britain's economic history if Labour are elected. Now, the question I'm asking our audience today is, Will Labour, do you think, do a better job than the Conservatives? Tell us why you think they will. Tell us why you think they won't. Uh, you get in touch. Call 0344 499 1000. Text 87 travel 2 or you can tweet me at Talk TV. Um, Tom, um, do you think that Labour will do a better job? No. 
Um, I also think... <laughs> and let's they, move on. <laughs> I think what's really depressing about them, yes, they are very similar. We're back to that kind of early to mid-2000s, dancing ahead of, of a pin. Yeah, what, really are the, what are the big differences in the policies? If you switch their rosettes, rosettes around, would anyone really notice? We're back to that kind of situation. But I think if I think about some of the worst policies that the government has been pursuing, if you think about net zero, if you think about the increasingly authoritarian turn of the state and clamping down on all kinds of... Um, civil liberties and so on. If you think about the gender stuff, which yes, this government has attempted to push back on, but still it's kind of carried on regardless. The Labour Party, whilst wanting to be very cautious, will be worse on all of those key issues. They're, so, they're um, insane on a lot of these issues. Absolutely. They will try to rein in the more insane elements because they also have a, have a better grasp of where the public is. Not particularly great, but they know that these issues upset people. But they're not going to be able to keep a lid on it. So I think on a lot of the issues that we often talk about a lot of the issues that I tend to write about and care about. They will be worse, but regardless of the fact that it's hard, that's not an argument to keep the Tories in place because they no, have proven but isn't themselves. Isn't that the fascinating dreadful. thing, though? When, and, and a lot of the polling seems to bear out this out, which is that you know the Tories are way behind in the polls. Um, nobody, no, nobody seems to think they've got mm -hmm. a chance in hell of, of winning the next election or there being a, a hung parliament. That the, the Labour are now so far ahead of the polls. That's not what people would have said a year ago. They thought mm -hmm. it was still a possibility. That that actually there doesn't nevertheless seem to be that enthusiasm for Labour, enthusiasm for Keir Starmer, certainly. It doesn't feel like 1997 when there was. A lot of people say everyone was enthusiastic. Well, they weren't. I mean, bearing in mind, John Major still got 30% mm -hmm. of the vote in 1997. Um, the Tories would dream of 30% <laughs> in the polls today. But but there was much more enthusiasm, so I think, on the on people who were voting Labour, many for the first time. Again, interesting, a lot of people who have been Labour voters who voted Margaret Thatcher and mm -hmm. then felt that Tony Blair was, you know, and, and, and Gordon Brown, they were safe pairs of hands. Um, there doesn't seem to be that enthusiasm. Why not? I think well, some of it will come down to kind of showmanship. I mean, in Keir Starmer, but also on the other side of the political aisle, we have an array of incredibly dull, sort of bank manager style politicians um, who lack any of that kind of spark. The time is different, as we were talking about. There isn't that kind of things can only get better mood out in the country economically. Things have got a lot worse, speaking. yeah. Absolutely. I think. Um, Although the similarities are also quite interesting, because I think if Labour do um, win even quite handsomely at the next election, it's not really going to be on the back of enthusiasm amongst what should be their base. This was yeah. also the underlying story a lot of the New Labour years, which is the hemorrhaging of the working class vote, people turning not to voting, and then later on kind of showing up voting for UKIP, Brexit, and then the mm. Tory party. So I think this won't, even if there is... To the extent there is enthusiasm, it won't be amongst the people who they were set up to represent. No. It's going to be amongst the kind of perhaps, middle class. Perhaps starting off with low expectations would be good for Labour because certainly they're. they're I, I've written a column they are low. today, <laughs> just picking <laughs> that up again. If you want to read that mm. online, um, yeah, or by the paper, but it is that thing we you know. The day the day after the general election, whoever wins, mm -hmm. the same stuff is in the in tray. You, you've got millions on waiting lists, millions on welfare, you've got massive debt, you've got the immigration issue. That doesn't go away just because mm -hmm. Labour, in illegal and legal immigration. You've got, you know, got all of the problems in the economy, um, low productivity, low growth. All of that is still sitting there. Absolutely. And it's not, there's this kind of sense. Maybe it's because people have got short political memories and the Tories have been in power for quite a long time. But you listen to the sort of liberal left commentary and they've got this idea in their heads that the reason that we have all these problems is because the Tories, they're a mixture of kind of feckless and nasty. And if you just have some nice people in there, some competent yeah. people in there, someone who's worked at the DPP or has loads of degrees and but is nice, but is a nice person, everything will be sorted. It's ridiculous. And also, if you look at the Labour front bench, you cannot say it's an embarrassment of talent and experience. Yes, they've been out of government for a long time. <laughs> yeah, exactly, the first part's right. But yes, they've been out of government for a long time. But these are not people who you think are going to kind of seize the levers of power and do something fantastical with it. Yeah. You just think it's going to be more than of the same. But it's worse. Just going, exactly. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that is the feel. Like, a lot of people get in touch with the show. I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on all of that. Do please get in touch. 0344 1000 is the number to call. Very quiet on the phone today. Now, often that could be because I've asked the wrong question, but I wonder if you want to get in touch about Rwanda, because how big a, how big a difference would Rwanda make? to your voting, because the Rwanda bill went back to the House of Commons. Ten amendments put in by the House of Lords uh, uh, over the last couple of weeks were voted back down. It's now gone back to the Lords. They're going to vote again on Wednesday. It gets ping-pong back. It's rather sort of elaborate, sort of old, sort of oldie-worldie sort of world where, you know, eventually Lords will give up and and, and Labour, and, and, sorry, uh, and, and Labour, Lib Dem and other peers will give up. And the uh, and the government will get, will get their way because the Commons has supremacy. Do you think, even if a plane ever takes off, 
with even one, <laughs> even one, just <laughs> one, uh, the uh, channel migrant to Rwanda. Even if even if 5,000 were taken to Rwanda, that's not going to happen. It's going to be maximum a few hundred this year, if, if any. Would that make a difference to Tory chances? I don't think so. I mean, you were talking to Lord Hayward earlier about how this has taken on symbolic yeah. importance. And that's right, because there's this kind of sense of even just being able to do it. The government should be able legal. to do this. Absolutely. Yes. So it does have that symbolic importance. I think the problem is at this point, it's got it's empty symbolism. People don't people have kind of switched off from what the government yeah. is doing. It's not even that they're kind of necessarily outraged on a day-to-day -day basis. They just see them as this kind of pathetic shower who can't do very much. So uh, getting a few hundred people onto a flight, I don't think is going to be anything to it's, move it's the It's not going to make the big difference. No. Uh, I do want to ask you just again briefly about uh, the Princess of Wales. As I said, the Sun front page today. Mm -hmm. um, great to see you again, Kate. Uh, this uh, exclusive pictures uh, along with TMZ, um, where Kate and William apparently walking around a farm shop in near Windsor at the weekend. She's carrying a bag, he's wearing a cap, greeted by... <laughs> I mean, most people would have thought, well, this is the picture, yeah. this is the video, it's not, it's not just a doctored picture, it's a, it's a video, this will stop all the online conspiracy theorists who think that it's the much worse her health and or they're not together or where is she, mm -hmm. all of the rumours that have abounded online, which I mean, not just in the tiny corner of the internet, but properly everywhere, that they would be done and dusted to date. Nope, this picture has been greeted with everyone going, that's not Kate. Mm. Um, I'm asking our audience today, I would like to know what you think the palace should do or can do to end the speculation. You can give us a call, I say, 0344-499-1000, text 87222 or tweet at Talk TV. Um, Tom, well, other than, yeah. other than oh, it's, it's a yeah. knockout, which is an idea I really do like, I, I reckon, I tell you what, I reckon Camilla would be good. Mm. I, I really like Camilla. She's about one of the you least rated. It, I think she's. Yeah. I think she's great. Um, but um, yeah, apparently uh, uh, it's not out, probably not on the agenda. But we'll check with the palace later. Mm -hmm. What can they do to end all this speculation, or is it impossible to end it? I think it's the latter. I wouldn't start from here. Is probably the yeah, way yeah, to put yeah. it. And I think what they've learned is if you try to kind of respond to this kind of swirl of conspiracy theories and whatnot you just end up feeding the beast. And I think this is probably a bit of an, a rude awakening for the palace in terms of how they've handled this because of the fact that um, they do seem quite wrong-footed when it comes to dealing with the news cycle in like the social media age and the churn of opinion and speculation. And I, I think it's a prompt not for them to open up more or to live stream everything or constantly try to meet where the kind of noise from social media is, is, is coming from. But to, just to take a step back and to realise that maybe less is more and that you don't need to constantly be on the front foot with these things because that's yep. what Royal Family used to do quite successfully. Yep. That was maintain that level but of Yeah, mystique. maybe you can do that when you don't have 24-hour also... news and you don't have social media and things are very, very different. Let's talk about something that genuinely is important. And again, where, whatever side you're on when it comes to the battles uh, in Gaza, I think we're all on the right side of, of things where we say we don't want any innocent civilians, mm. particularly children, uh, to be dying, whether it's in, in shelling from either side, being used as human, human shields or getting in the way uh, and, and, uh, of, of the IDF attempt to oust Hamas from uh, Rafa, as they want to do, is their next stage of their battles. But the imminent starvation of huge numbers of people is a serious concern and should be for everybody on all sides. More than a million people, according to your report, are at risk of basically of starving to death. Uh, they are looking at famine levels of catastrophic levels of hunger in Gaza. They say famine is imminent. This is a, a coalition of aid organizations, including uh, Oxfam. Uh, the situation, they, according to the integrated food security phase classification, they say that this is man made starvation and action needs to be taken. Uh, a senior UN, UN figure has said, we know that once a famine is declared, it is way too late. Now, we've got this battle between those who are saying, well, it's Israel who's stopping the aid getting in. Mm -hmm. Israel saying, we're not stopping the aid getting in. The problem is Hamas using uh, um, uh, civilians as, as, their, as fodder, effectively, in their battle with Israel. What should the West do? I mean, we've just had a phone call between Joe Biden and Benjamin Netanyahu. First phone call in a month, which I think is outrageous on both men's behalf, mm -hmm. given uh, how serious the situation is in Gaza. But what can, what can be done? Well, it seems like what the, 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 the Western community, such as it is, is sort of united in this message of 
supporting Israel, but also raising increasing concerns about the, the question of aid. It, as you've already gestured to, we need to take as read that there's an element of fog of, of fog of war even in this. Yeah. Um, there's kind of competing claims and counterclaims on both sides. It is important that when we're talking about Hamas, you are talking about an organisation which is willing to outright lie to propagandise and to put its own people in harm's way. Yeah, I mean, there's some question which... marks about the figures that the Hamas-run health ministry have been putting out in terms of the percentage of, of those who've died are, are women and children, mm. which is just, you know, many are saying is just, is just simply not, it's mm -hmm. not believable. No, absolutely. And that's something which I think we're continually reminded of. But of course, anyone looking at the situation there recognises that a way needs to be found to ensure that as much aid as is humanly possible can get through to yeah. those people, because these are not the people who launched October I mean, 7th. A lot of these these people, are the people no. caught in the crossfire the, of horrendous I mean, there, war, there may be a lot of Hamas support started. from those people from us. We know that. We know there is a lot of support, but people who have been uh, propagandised for, for, for a decade or two, two decades will we'll, 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 we'll feel that way. I don't care. Mm. I still want their children to be fed. Absolutely. I, I, it seems to me uh, a, a crucial point. Um, at the end of the day, People, you know, the, 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 quite apart from the human catastrophe and tragedy of anyone dying of starvation uh, in, in Gaza, you've also got the, the, the propaganda impact of that on Israel because there, the world is going to blame. They get blamed for everything that happens there, even though Hamas, I would say, are, are the guilty party in all of this. Um, but you know, but, but Israel needs to understand that that this is not just about defeating. Hamas fighters, it's about defeating Hamas ideology. And they're not going to do that if the whole of the Middle East and the rest of the world and the blame them for these deaths. I, I, I suppose the problem that confronts them, though, is the fact that they're being blamed for absolutely everything in this conflict. Anyway. There's been this jumping to conclusions. Even now, even after certain claims have been debunked, whether or not it was Israel, you know, blowing up that hospital, which was later found to be a missile from Palestine Islamic Jihad, or whether or not it was the kind of constant claims about are they exaggerating what happened on October 7th. It doesn't matter how many times those things have been debunked by the evidence, by mainstream newspapers, people who aren't necessarily even inclined to be pro-Israel have proven that a lot of these claims made by Hamas and their apologists are nonsense. They still live on. And yeah. I think Israel in particular, if we're talking about the sort of hearts and minds aspects of this globally, particularly where the younger generation is, they're, they're going to have a real trouble kind of dislodging and, some of these myths. And the BBC the doesn't help, does it, with a lot of their reports? We've had you know, some reports about uh, IDF fighters beating and uh, uh, mistreating uh, doctors at, mm -hmm. a, at a hospital in Gaza. Now, I wasn't there, you weren't there, we weren't there, but we, you know, we, we have um, organisations which we hope can try and get to the truth, but when the BBC relies on, as it's now emerged, on their Palestinian journalist sources, uh, most of whom have actually, you know, supported Hamas, they literally are, they're, they're, they're tweeting support for Hamas and, and you know, celebrating, you know, October the 7th, things like that. I mean, it is simply untenable mm -hmm. that uh, an organisation paid for by our taxes should be putting out that sort of propaganda on behalf of a terrorist organisation. And it's a recurring story, not just with the BBC, yeah. but talk about New York Times a minute ago. They were found to have one of their photographers on the ground who had previously been posting not only anti-Semitic but pro-Hitler content on I mean, social hello. media. You would think that sort of thing would have been flagged up, but... This is the uh, this is quite situation bizarre, isn't it? Of um, let me just also ask you um, just about um, the new bond. The new bond. Let's put a picture up for those who are watching. But if you've uh, if just if you're listening, uh, you've probably seen pictures. This is um, Aaron Taylor Johnson. He apparently forget all that speculation about Idris Elba and who knows who else. He apparently has been formally offered the role of James Bond um, and will sign a contract this week to take over from Daniel Craig. Um, he's um, now I've said. The ladies and I in the office, we were chatting about him. He's, he's, you know, he's got to be a good-looking fellow. That's part of the deal, guys. Um, he's quite a lot of hair. He's got, he's got very long, curly hair. I, I, that's not going to fly for James Bond for mm -hmm. me. I'm, I'm, I thought Idris Elba would have been ideal, and not for woke reasons, but just for, you know, Idris reasons. <laughs> <laughs> I got a photo with it just once, Jenny. I put it out on Twitter as you know, some black tie event, which my husband took with his uh, now wife standing behind looking very unhappy. And I did actually be like, one of us is much happier about this photo <laughs> than the other. I'm literally like grinning like a Cheshire cat. He's like, who is this mad woman? He's just going to have a photo with me. Um, he's probably used but, to it, I imagine. Yeah, he's probably used to it. <laughs> Surely, Idris, you must get a lot of that. But Aaron Taylor Johnson, does he, does he have the look and feel of a Bond to you? See, I'm, I'm not necessarily a huge Bond fan because I know there's a lot of purism where they're concerned. Yeah. Remember there was, all that, there was all that outcry when Daniel Craig took it because he was had blondish hair and they were like, yeah. that's outrageous. You can't he has to be, yes. And he looked like too much of a bruiser. So I don't take too much of a... But, you know, maybe they should just... Why not long hair? Give him a top knot, 
Give it to <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> just completely destroy the franchise just for just man bun. Purposes. Yeah, have a man bun. Oh, he's, he's going to be broke anyway, say. isn't he? That's going to be tedious. But anyway, we shall see. Right, let's move on. Uh, let's come back to uh, what you've got to say about the Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Reeves. Amazingly, something you've actually got to say. Uh, she is promising in a speech tonight a new chapter in Britain's economic history if Labour are elected. Talking about how this is like a 1979 moment coming in. Very different from 1997, of course, when, you know, the economy was looking just fine. How very nice for Blair and Brown. Uh, not uh, so easy, of course, with Margaret Thatcher coming in 79 after uh, Labour had gone cap in hand to the IMF. But will Labour, I'm asking, if and when they get elected, do a better job than the Conservatives? Simple question. But I want you to tell us why you think they will, if you think they will, and why you think they won't, if you think they won't. Give us a call. 0344 499 text on 8722. Or you can get in touch on X at Talk TV. Hugh has done just that and says, no, the economy is so far gone, it's doubtful anyone or anything can fix it. Certainly not economists, Tories, Labour, or any of the other nutters. Well, yeah, you are. You say, it, say what you think. Uh, Chris says yes, because they have far better economic policies. Uh, we're also asking, of course, about that new video of the Princess of Wales, which has prompted yet more online conspiracy theories about her health. What should the palace do to end all the speculation? Katie, not Kate, Katie says absolutely nothing. After Easter was the message, everyone should leave her and the family alone. That is the thing. They said she's going to be out of action until Easter. No, I... And then it's not, it's not Easter. I have not been allowed to eat my Easter egg yet. It can't be Easter yet. Uh, you've also been getting touch on the phones. Keep those calls coming in. Let's go to Herbie, who is in London. Hello, Herbie. Yes, good morning to you. Hey, good morning um, to you. What do you want to say? Well, what I want to say, it's up to the public now. If they want change, it's in their hands. If they don't go out and vote, then there's a problem. They can make it happen, but they've got to go out and vote. And the vote is to make change by voting independence. That's what, that's what you think. So this is the thing, because a lot of people are saying the trouble with the Tories is they're kind of labour light. And of course, then you just get labour. Um, and people are saying well, they're not really offering anything new. There's, no, there's not really a cigarette paper really between uh, uh, the, the, the two big parties. So when you say independence, you mean like just voting for the local independent candidates, even if they don't have much chance of getting elected? Well... <laughs> How can you say that? I, I, I've been a councillor and I, I, I did go independent and I did make change. I stopped the whole people's own from closing and uh, going private and it, it worked. Good and for you. Do you mind me asking me. which party you were with before you were an independent? Liberal. You were Lib Dem oh, or, or Liberal. OK, um, now there's one thing, being a councillor, the smaller elections, got that local, you know, personal vote on personal issues. But of course, lots of people feel that when they're electing, it, by voting in a general election, they're not even just voting for the local candidate. They're voting for the party they want in charge and the man or the woman they want in charge of the country in number 10. So how does that work? Well, the thing is, is that you're not governed by the party politics like I was originally. That's true. I had my own vision, I had my own views, and I used them. Yeah. I did not have to go the party line. And people would I have wasn't. liked that. Well, this is it. I, this is the way to go about doing it. We've had the self same two parties for years on year on year. Go for change, give it a chance, even if it's done in once. It may make a complete difference in the future. Yeah, well, that's it. People always say, never, you know, these things can't change. But all the uh, experts told us, you know, it was the end of two-party politics in 2010. That changed. Boris Johnson was going to get three terms. Well, that didn't work out. Can I ask you, though, given a choice between Labour and the Tories, realistically, at the next general election, even if you yourself vote uh, independent, who do you think would um, do a better job on the economy? None of them. Absolutely Just none no of them. No hope at all. They've had, they've had the chances upon chance and done absolutely nothing about it but made it worse all round. Herbie, thank you for being so straight. I can see why people would have voted for you. Herbie in London, thank you so much for that. Coming up after the break, author J.K. Rowling has labelled the SNP's controversial new hate crime law as the mother of all April Fool's jokes. She's quite happy to be arrested on it. Oh, and so am I. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer. You're with Talk TV. We'll talk about that up next. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, oi, treat girl.
when JK Rowling says, let's just be honest. That's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to... <laughs> Yeah. For... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley-Brew and you are with Talk TV. Now, the author, J.K. Rowling, has labelled the SNP's controversial new hate crime law as the mother of all April Fool's jokes. She says she will continue to call a man a man amid fears that the new law, which comes into force on April the 1st, will be used against women campaigning for single sex rights and protections. Joining me right now is the Alaba Party Westminster Group leader, Neil Hanvey. Uh, good morning to you, Neil. Morning, Julia. Thank you very much for joining us. Now, if you could just explain to us what this new law actually is that comes into place on, Oct on, on April the 1st, because this is the Hate Crime and Public Order, brackets, Scotland, close brackets, Act. Um, uh, and uh, I just want to know, like, what does it actually mean for people? Well, it's, um, it's a, 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 a piece of legislation that brings together um, some previous laws around hate crimes, and it adds in some additional um, measures, such as stirring up hatred. Um, but the, the problem with the legislation is that it's incredibly poorly drafted. The bar for prosecution, so the test for prosecution uh, for um, uh, uh, these types of offences is extremely low. The... Um, uh, the the, the mechanisms in which prosecutions can take place and the offences can be reported uh, are extremely vague and, and really open the door for vexatious um, uh, allegations and yeah. then a litigious process to, to defend yourself, uh, where the process becomes the, the punishment effectively. But what it, it effectively does is it makes telling the truth unlawful. Uh, uh, it, yeah, which um, is which can uh, be a problem when it comes to the trans issue. I'm going to say this is um, we're talking yeah. there's going to be training guidance, communications planning. I think that's probably not going to be enough, but cre it creates a criminal offence of stirring up of hatred, um, uh, yeah. expanding on a similar offence about based on 
racist abuse that's been on the statute book for decades. And offences are considered aggravated, so you get a stiffer sentence if they involve prejudice on the basis of age, disability, race, religion, sexual orientation or transgender identity. But the, the tr problem we've had with that, and we're accused of, people accused, and J.K. Rowling's constantly accused of this online as well, that it's transphobic to state the biological fact that a trans woman uh, is not a woman, a trans woman is... By the, the, the trans bit is the key, is, is a man, and, a, uh, and, uh, and she has made these statements many times, so have I. When people say, well, that is in some way expressing hatred or dehumanising uh, someone who uh, has a trans identity, then you can be accused of this sort of hate speech. Now, we've seen in, in England many times when these, these things called non-crime hate incidents uh, happen. Uh, yeah. People have got a record effect. Often it can prevent them from getting jobs with children or, or getting other sort of jobs because they've got, like, not a criminal record, but they sort of do have. Even if there's no evidence of anything, just someone said they thought they found it offensive, they thought it was hateful. They didn't even need to be the, the object of it or even be in the same room that the police could still investigate. That's correct. This goes even further, though, because... I mean, J.K. Rowling lives in Scotland. I live in, in England. Um, someone could make a complaint about me tweeting the fact that a trans woman is not a woman about any particular person. They could make a complaint to the police in Scotland. The police in Scotland could then ask my local police force, the Metropolitan Police, to come and investigate me, and I could be investigated and prosecuted for that crime, couldn't I? Um, well, I'm not entirely sure how that would work um, in terms of you being brought to justice in Scotland, because that's what the law would be in effect. It's the publishing that is mm. the offence, and so I'm not entirely sure how they would, uh, to, for lack of a better word, extradite you from, uh, from England into Scotland. But that principle uh, is true not just uh, within the constituent parts of the United Kingdom, but across the globe. So if I was in the States and I posted something on my Twitter feed whilst I was in America uh, and that was reported to be uh, 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 constitute a hate crime uh, for whatever reason, then when I returned home, although that post was um, uh, put up in uh, the States, uh, if it's available in Scotland, then it's considered to be published in Scotland and therefore the law would come into effect. Um, but, it, it, I mean, the, the whole um, content of this piece of legislation is extremely controversial, not just by what's in it, but by what's not in it. So they have deliberately excluded sex as a, a protected characteristic. Yeah. So women and misogyny are not incorporated into this bill. And the caveat there has been that they are going to bring in a specific piece of legislation to address misogyny at some future date. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that with the Scottish government's obsession with queer theory policies, that um, uh, misogyny legislation will include trans-identifying males. Yes. And therefore, that is no defence against yeah. the type of misogyny, the type of homophobia that we are seeing and uh, that I recently experienced in the chamber from a Tory MP, Alicia Cairns, when she launched into a blistering attack on me for having the temerity to speak about LGB people uh, as a specific group yes. uh, and leaving out transsexual people. And because, it's that because, centering... Because trans identity has got absolutely nothing people. to do with sexuality. And absolutely I don't know nothing. why they're lump, lumped in together. And we know, you know, the LGB alliance was set up deliberately to make that point that, that actually they wanted to yes. protect rights of gay people. And indeed, yes. we, we, we know particularly young women, lesbian women, are actually some of the people yes. who are having some of their rights yes. and safety most trampled on. But this is the thing. I mean, J.K. Rowling, she's been threatened by numerous people and reports to the police. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, one activist, uh, India Willoughby, a, a, a journalist uh, who, has, uh, who, who is a trans-identified male, um, who is basically talking about, you know, this is, uh, this is being, being misgendered. She believes... He, sorry, he believes that being misgendered is a uh, uh, should be a crime, should be prosecuted under it, and that it's a hate crime. Um, and there was some advice online to to J.K. Rowling, who's just been an absolute hero on all of this, standing mm. up for this, basically yes, saying, your did. best advice to delete the post about India Willoughby as they most likely contravene the new law. Start deleting. To which J.K. Rowling replied, if you genuinely imagine I delete posts calling a man a man so as not to be prosecuted under this ludicrous law, stand by for the mother of all April Fool's jokes. Now, this is the thing. I know numerous women um, online and friends we are more than happy 
to be arrested for saying that we do not believe that a man can become a woman or a woman can become a man and, and naming the, a, a biological male as a male. And I'm quite happy to go to prison for that. Definitely have decided that is something I'm willing to go to prison yeah. for because I will not be, I will not be bullied cajoled or threatened into yeah. into telling a lie when I know it not to be true, because that is 1984 Orwellian stuff, isn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, there's two points I would make. First one is that it turns out that uh, in all of this mess, uh, J.K. Rowling's grasp on reality is even more impressive than her gift for fantasy. <laughs> uh, and the, and the, the, the second point is that, you know, um, for for women to be subjected to this type of gaslighting from their own governments uh, is, is beyond Orwellian. I mean, Orwellian. It, it really is. This is a psychological violence against women. This is telling women that they cannot identify uh, groups of people, uh, male groups of people, uh, uh, coherently and crisply uh, to maintain their safety uh, and uh, and to tell the truth uh, in a court of law, for example, uh, where it would be considered to be a, a hate crime if you rightly gendered or you spoke of the correct sex yeah. of your attacker. Uh, uh, these types of um, uh, policies have significant impacts on the rights and safeties of women. And, the, yeah. the, you know, the Labour Party are making uh, um, a, a lot of noise about uh, violence against women and girls but they will introduce exactly the same yeah. slate of policies should the British public be foolish enough to vote them in. Well, and I noticed in your earlier segment, you were talking about there being very little difference between the two uh, main parties. Uh, the, the big difference is that with the Labour Party, you can guarantee that you will have yeah. all of these queer theory-based oh, policies yeah. introduced oh, oh, the, the culture and that wars are going to get absolutely everyone. Yeah, the yeah. culture wars are going to get worse, but the Tories have not stood up uh, 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 on this front enough. Uh, really good to talk to you, uh, Neil yeah. uh, Hanvey. He's an Alba Party uh, uh, MP and he's the Westminster Group leader for them, former SMP, uh, obviously. Um, now, um, Tom Slater is still with us in the studio. He's editor of Spiked Online. The, the targeting of J.K. Rowling is quite extraordinary. Um, the murder threats, death threats, the, the, the rape threats, the abuse threats, the general threats of violence that she receives are off the scale from people who are the, the people who tend to have hashtag be kind mm. in, in their biogs on their Twitter handles. She ain't backing down. I am loving the new come and have a go if you think you're hard <laughs> enough, J.K. Rowling, because she is absolutely a hero for so many people. Great writer, love Harry Potter, really enjoyed that. Uh, I, I love the fact she's just taking on all comers. The thing is, they're targeting her, and we know why they're targeting her. These, these trans activists are targeting her because they think, if you can, if you can make her shut up, mm -hmm. if you can silence her, scare her, threaten her enough, then we all will give up. She's, you know, she's incredibly rich, incredibly powerful, incredibly successful. She's got you know, millions of followers. If she is forced to zip it, as mm -hmm. all good women must do, then every woman will follow. They picked the wrong woman, didn't they? Absolutely, and that's why it's been so inspiring to see what courageous stance she's taken in relation to this. She didn't need to pick up this fight, even if it bothered her. She could surely console herself with um, all the hundreds of millions, <laughs> if not billions of pounds that she has sloshing around. But this is clearly something that for her is an issue of fundamental principle. My favourite thing to do whenever people go at JK Rowling is to ask them what it is that she's said yeah. that's supposedly so hateful. Um, she's made, a, written a very nuanced, liberal piece on her website talking She's about her She's tweeted numerous times. This. Not a single word that she ever uttered, written, hinted at, suggested anything, anything but respect and kindness towards trans people. Exactly. Just for standing up for women's rights and for sex-based spaces and so on. Something which, due to her own personal experience, she feels is very important. Um, she's been turned into a witch, effectively. Um, and it's a reminder, not only just of her own courage for standing up to that, but also, as you say, the crucial importance of people taking that stand where they can. Because yeah, and just say, we won't, we won't put up with it. But there's exactly. that genuinely, I, I mean, really, trans women aren't women. They're trans-identified men. Get the handcuffs. 
can I, arrest me. You can arrest me. You can put me in prison. You will never make me pretend that I believe the lie that men can become women and women can become men. And that's how that's how millions of women feel. I use the word, they come for <laughs> they come for JK Rowling. They're gonna have to make their way through a heck of a lot of other women and other and other men who who are, who are fed up with this nonsense. I, I, you'd think the SNP would have learnt their lesson over Nicola Sturgeon and trans rapists, you know, being put in uh, to, to women's prisons. They have not learnt their lesson. We are going to have to, we're going to have to go right, you know, right to the wall on this one. But there are millions of women like J.K. Rowling, like Maya Forster, Helen Joyce, and all these other fantastic heroes, and little old me as well. Very, very happy. You can put me behind bars. I will not be forced into that Orwellian lie that a trans woman is a woman. They aren't. They're men. Absolutely. And I think that's one thing that the S&P or any other government are going to have to recognise. People are not just going to They're quiet really not. People have had enough, indeed. Thank you so much more from uh, Tom coming up. Now, today we are asking about the Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Rees, who's promising in a new speech tonight a new chapter in Britain's economic history if Labour are elected. Will Labour do a better job than the Conservatives on the economy? That's one to know from you. Tell us why you think they will. Tell us why you think they won't. Give us a call, 0344 499 text on 87222, or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Catherine says, no, Labour will destroy the UK economy. What, more than it already has been? Uh, Terry says, yes, they did amazingly the last time they were in power. Bring back Brown. Uh, we're also asking about a new video of the Princess of Wales, which is prompting even more online conspiracy theories about her health. What should the palace do to end all the speculation? Alan says, stop putting out fake photos and videos. You're not helping. Uh, you've also, as I say, been getting in touch on the phones. Do keep those calls coming. And let's go to Dave, who is in London. Hello, Dave. Hello. Hello. Sorry. Hello, Dave. Can you hear me? I don't think Dave is there, is he? Hello, Dave. Hello, hello. Hello, Janelle. Hello, we got you. We got you. I can just hear background noise. Now, you want, thanks so much for calling you. You want to talk about all the speculation about Kate. Yeah. What can the palace do to just put it to well, rest? I just think, basically, she come out with his stands outside Buckingham Palace or... Oh, one second. Let me just have his stand. Um, come out, just... <laughs> You know, just say, there's, I'm here, I'm all right. Or so she needs to come out in front of, you know, the, yeah, you know, the, the BBC, camera, you know, ITV. There's more people about. Yeah, yeah. Any, on every single programme for five minutes, outside Buckingham Palace, I'm here. Uh, but, so you've, you've got uh, just normal people who can stand there, they can have all the security. Yeah, I'm here, I'm all right, nothing's wrong. And you reckon that would stop it? The conspiracy oh, theories would go? It's got, it's, it's got to, because it's, it's just, you know, people now it's find it hard to put food on the table and do this and do it, get enough. And you don't really want... If, personally, I would actually say, right, since the Queen uh, passed away, who was a great Queen, I'd actually knock it on the head. Interesting. You think you think there isn't a future? I don't think there's a future for the uh, for the monarchy, no. Um, you know, they're trying to all the coinage, all the um, banknotes, uh, which is going to cost us some money, it's going to cost us millions of pounds, you know. Um, I, just, I just think it should now say, right, you know, you, you've had your time... There's a, a lot of sequels. So just go, just, you know, finish it all off. OK, right. Well, that that that, that ended differently from what I expected. Okay, Dave, thank you very much. Lee Grab, we got you on the line. Uh, coming up after the break, going to talk about something completely different. Britain's roads, they're at a breaking point thanks to potholes. The pothole repair bill is now saying a whopping £16 billion. Pounds. We'll talk about that. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer. You're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, uh, missing. <laughs> there was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on mm. the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think but, like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley and You are with Talk TV. Now, Britain's roads are at breaking point thanks to potholes with the pothole repair bill for the nation now standing at a whopping £16 billion, partly due to heavier electric vehicles and larger vehicles making the problem worse. Meanwhile, councils are launching yet another war on motorists with more fines than ever before. Joining me right now is motoring journalist and no doubt fed up driver, Quentin Wilson. Hello, Quentin. How are you? Fine, thank you, Julie. Lovely to see you. Probably, probably all right, as long as you haven't driven over a pothole today. The pothole problem has been an issue, I mean, for so many years in this country. Are we uniquely bad at repairing potholes? I think you've got to remember, we went through two decades, didn't we, of uh, four wheels bad, two wheels good, and our, our roads were underinvested and, and neglected, and that's the reason why they're the crumbling ruin they are now. I think, you know, we need to admit that they are critical infrastructure uh, without which the country can't function and we can't be productive. Um, when you see shots like that, I mean, there's a there's a public safety issue there, isn't there? So it's about political will. But remember, back in the 2000s, John Prescott said, you know, I'm going to get 10 percent of the population on public transport and we mustn't build any more new roads because more people will use them. <laughs> Well, I think Brilliant. we passed all that now and, and we realise that this modal shift to public transport hasn't happened and probably isn't going to happen. Um, and we need to fix the roads that we've got. Otherwise, the country is in, in dire peril. But also at the same time as not building more roads, everyone had the great idea of bringing in 10 million more people um, and then wondering whether where those people were going to go, how they were going to get about their daily lives. But I mean, this is it. The breaking point is... Uh, the cost of fixing these potholes has gone sky high. The longer you leave them, the more they cost. And, of course, we've got a lot more electric vehicles, which apparently weigh tons more and, and are causing more damage. Oh, it's not you there. No? The, the idea that electric cars wear out pothole, wear out roads more when you've got 44-tonne HGVs. Oh, OK. Um, you, well, Julia, come on, that's counterintuitive. That, no, no, that, that's just what the article's saying. I'm just like, you know, I'm, I've got no idea what cars weigh. I, 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 listen... You know what, Quentin, you know me on cars. I've got a grey car. That's all I know about it. I've literally, you're not that's, daft. That's, 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 all, I've, that's all I've got. Yeah, that's all I've got in the tank, quite literally. Not. But this is the thing. So you've got, you know, you've got the, the councils are basically saying, we can't afford to mend all these potholes. They then get bigger and bigger, end up costing more. Councils then paying out a fortune, basically, to, uh, to pay back motorists for the damage these potholes have done if, because they're supposed to have paid them. How did we end up with £16 billion bill? I mean, that, no, there isn't that money. There has been always this, this research that's come out every single year by the Asphalt Association telling us this. 
and we haven't done anything about it as 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 a, a country and as governments. And it's not just the Conservative; it was Labour before. So we need just to have this political will to say we're going to change this. We're going to make it better. And also, we need to look at better surfaces. And 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 we can't just carry on putting a splodge of tarmac in a yeah. hole as we have done for decades and decades then watching it degrade in a matter of months and then doing it again or not doing it again. So we need, you know, proper materials for 21st century roads. And, and, and we need to look at this and say, how do we solve this problem permanently? Because if we don't, people will get hurt and our productivity mm. will decline significantly. Yeah, and it does impact on that. I have to say also, for me, it's just sort of about sort of general feeling of being surrounded by things just collapsing and not, not functioning properly. You know, I've travelled in a lot of you know, third world nations, I think we call them developing nations now, with terrible roads. Often, though, better roads than I see in central London even. You'd think, well, how on earth, how on earth have we, as a first world rich country, we might be rich once anyway, um, got come to this? Um, but the thing is, especially when people are paying more and more to drive on the roads. I mean, huge percentage of the amount of money you pay on, on diesel and on petrol, it goes in taxes. Now, of course, that doesn't all go into the roads, but I think we'd expect perhaps a bit more of it to go into the roads than it, than it is, plus all the fines uh, that are being charged. Now, there's also another story here about more than half of drivers face being fined for traffic offences by councils under what's been called a new war on motorists. Um, uh, 85 of England's 152 highway authorities now have the power to fine drivers up to £70 for traffic violations like getting caught in a yellow box, making an illegal U-turn, driving in a bus lane when not permitted. Um, and that includes more than 27 million potential drivers in those areas. Now, look, if you, if you break the rules on the road, that's your choice, isn't it? You you, if you drive in a bus lane or you do a U-turn when it says no U-turns, probably for a good reason, then you have to expect to get fined. But... This does add to this general feeling that people, and especially the yellow box thing, when often you, you really did think the car was going to go ahead of you and it hasn't moved. People feel when they're driving that they are just a cash cow now. They do. And I mean, it's not surprising, really, when you've got these councils that are clearly trying to raise revenue. It doesn't improve road safety if your wheel is slightly on a yellow line in a box, as, as, as I've had, and you get the ticket through and you think... Do you know, this really isn't fair, and you understand that this is just about money. Yeah. And, and we are, as a, you know, what, 37 million of us, uh, the electorate that drive, that have licences, we are voters. And I think it's, it's really important to understand that we shouldn't put up with this for such a long time. And well, we how, how, do we, how do we not put up with it? Well, you kind of go with the party that says, look, they are going to help, but shows they're going to help. And some of the stuff that I hear from the Conservatives seems a little uh, like empty rhetoric when they've been in charge for things for so long. Yeah, yeah. And I want somebody who understands about roads and cars and fuel and electric cars, who knows their stuff, who can have a conversation with me eye to eye. And I know that person is actually informed, intelligent yeah. and learned. Well, you'll have to try someone other than me because I definitely can't do that. <laughs> Quentin Wilson, thank you so much. Great to talk to you. Um, Tom Slater, do you have a car? Do you drive? No. no see, I mean, I barely can't drive. Our, 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 our car sometimes has cobwebs on it. I drive so little. But, but that's the thing. A lot of these policies are being made by people who don't drive. They live in central London. They've got public transport available to them 24-7. Yeah, but even in London, people need their cars, like, mm. to take the kids to and from school. A lot of people drive for a living yep. as well. And you'll never find anyone who's furious about that, someone who has to as a matter of, in terms of being a delivery driver or a cabbie, driving through London on a daily basis. The idea that we are just going to kind of move away from cars is ridiculous. Yeah, it's not been borne out by decades happen. now, so we need to reverse no, exactly. this. Exactly. Oh, I think we're all in flying taxis, we heard earlier this week, but there we go. <laughs> Good luck with that. Coming up in the next hour, more from Tom Slater and Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves is pledging a decade of national renewal if Labour wins the next general election. And is Banksy's new mural on the side of a block of flats really art, or is it just plain old vandalism? I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed it was another that. era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to the show. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer and you're with Talk TV. We're on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And I'm with you live from 10 until 1 if you've just tuned in. Where have you been? Coming up in this hour, MPs have rejected all 10 of the House of Lords amendments to the government's Rwanda bill. But ministers insist flights could still take off within months. We'll talk to Sir Ian Duncan-Smith about that. And Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves will pledge a decade of national renewal if Labour wins the general election. In a speech later today, she is going to compare the challenges to those faced by Margaret Thatcher in 1979. But will Labour really change this country in the same way? And street artist Banksy has confirmed that it is him who is responsible for a new mural on a block of flats in North London. But is this really art or is it just plain old vandalism? First then, let's get the latest news headlines with Elliot Gopkin. Good morning. The controversial Rwanda bill has suffered another setback after MPs rejected the House of Lords' changes to the policy. All ten amendments, which included allowing courts to question Rwanda's safety, were overturned. It comes after the government insisted the country is safe, despite the Supreme Court previously ruling it is not. Former Home Office adviser Claire Pearsall told Talk TV some of the changes the Lords wanted were just common sense. One of which was looking at um, those coming from Afghanistan who had fought for the United Kingdom. And they wanted some kind of safeguard that they wouldn't get sent to Rwanda, that we would honour our um, legal obligation to them to resettle them. And the House of Commons just went, no. Israel has agreed to send a team to Washington to discuss its planned Rafa operation after the US president warned that going ahead with it would be a mistake. Joe Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spoke on the phone on Monday as tensions between the two countries grow over the war in Gaza. It comes after the White House said Israel had killed Hamas's third most senior leader in an attack on an underground compound last week.
Marmite owner Unilever has announced plans to cut 7,500 jobs uh, across its global operations. The UK-based firm said it also planned to spin off its ice cream unit, which is home to popular brands such as Magnum, Walls and Ben & Jerry's. The company employs around 128,000 staff. Most of the job losses will be office-based. A new report out today is warning that roads in England and Wales are at breaking point with pothole repairs at an eight-year high. The annual alarm survey found that local councils were expected to fix two million potholes in the current financial year. That's a 43% jump from last year. These people in Chesterfield told Talk TV they are a daily nuisance. Every road you, you drive down, pothole, pothole, pothole after pothole, it's awful. Pretty sure the track in my car is gone. Just a genuine nightmare. There's like every single road has got potholes on. They're tyre eaters, they're alloy wheel killers. Yeah, I had a flat tyre last week. From the potholes? Yeah, from the potholes, yeah. Reported it multiple times to the council and they've just done nothing. Uh, my family have tried reporting it and they, you just can't get through. Meanwhile, a new poll has found just 3% of dentists believe the government's plans to fix the industry will result in them seeing more NHS patients. In a survey of more than 1,000 practices across England, 9 in 10 said the proposals to inject £200 million into services are not sufficiently ambitious to meet the scale of the challenge facing NHS dentistry. Darren Jones, the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, says many are going abroad as a result. What are the reasons? Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, plenty of fine and dry weather out there for this afternoon and it's still feeling mild as well, but it's not bone dry. As you can see from the earlier satellite and radar picture, we have seen some showers passing through eastwards, but they are mostly tending to disappear across parts of Scotland. However, over areas of the Midlands, the West Country and some eastern parts of England, there may be some heavy and thundery showers this afternoon. And before the day is out, there will be rain arriving across parts of Devon and Cornwall. But as I said, it's mild for the time of year. Temperatures a little above average, up to 50 or 16 degrees Celsius. Overnight, that rain across Devon and Cornwall will steadily move its way north and eastwards. Another pulse of rain also across Ireland and Northern Ireland. Now, there will be some heavy downpours across parts of England and Wales, particularly across the high ground of Wales and later in the night over areas of the Pennines. There will also be some showery rain for eastern parts of Scotland. So pretty wet, but there will be dry conditions in the far southwest and the far northwest as well. Now, through tomorrow, that rain continues across parts of northern England, the north and west of Wales, eastern parts of Scotland as well. Still some heavy downpours likely, but it does ease through the day. Either side of that, it will be mostly fine and dry with sunshine in the north where it will be cool but mild in the south. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good afternoon and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley Bruin. You are with Talk TV. Still with me in the studios, editor of Spiked Online, Tom Slater. Uh, good afternoon. We'll hear more from you in a moment. Now, today I'm asking you two questions. We're asking about the Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Rees. She's promising in a big speech tonight a new chapter in Britain's economic history if Labour are elected. She says this is Labour's 1979 moment in terms of coming into power like Margaret Thatcher did. Well, will Labour do a better job than the Conservatives? That's what I'm asking you. And tell us why you think they will. Tell us why you think they won't. We're also asking you about a new video of the Princess of Wales, which has somehow managed to prompt even more online conspiracy theories about her health and her whereabouts. I want to know, what should the palace do to end the speculation? Uh, suggestion so far is that she stand outside Buckingham Palace with all the TV cameras on and just say, here I am. Uh, is that the only thing that will work? Um, give us a call on 0344 499 1000. You can text on 87222 or you can get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls are charged at the national rate. Text costs one standard network rate message. Uh, let's move on now and let's talk about that uh, set of votes last night in the House of Commons. MPs rejected all 10 of the House of Lords amendments to the government's Rwanda bill, but ministers insist flights could still take off uh, to the African nation with channel migrants on board with Within months. Joining me right now to discuss this is former Conservative Party leader Sir Ian Duncan Smith. Uh, good uh, afternoon to you. 
And Julia. Hi. Thank you so Thank much you. for joining us. Now, I know you've got a vote to go and get to, or a, 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 so we will get straight down to a debate. Apologies, a debate. Right, look, we've, yeah. you know, we've, had, the, we've start, had the start of the ping pong over the Rwanda bill. Um, those 10 amendments were defeated. We think there might be some more amendments from uh, uh, Labour and others uh, in the uh, House of Lords. It then comes back uh, to uh, the Commons. How soon, realistically, do you think that could be on the statute book and a flight actually take off with at least one channel migrant on board? Well, that, <clears throat> that, to be fair, is up to the unelected chamber, who uh, <clears throat> most almost all those amendments were aimed at one thing, which I honestly generally... I listened to all the arguments about it, but they basically wrecked the purpose of the bill. So um, we got rid of them all. They've got to go back. And uh, the Lords now uh, has to decide whether or not it's time to accept the will of the House of Commons and get on with it, really. Um, I mean, with well, the I ping pong, they, it can go back and forth a few times. Certainly Penny Morden, the business leader, in the, 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 sorry, the leader of the Commons in, uh, in her, her, her announcements the other day, gave very, very less and less time each time this comes back to the House of Commons. So basically, the Commons can at any point just say, that's enough now, we're just going to keep it. Because the, the Commons is elected and has precedence. So are we just going through the yeah. motions of virtue signalling by the Lords now? Yeah, no, that's very much the case. I think... Um, I heard uh, Chakrabarti on the radio today talking, extolling the virtues of some of the Conservative uh, peers. But the Conservative peers that she was naming, and I really don't think, uh, were actually opposed, are really kind of opposed to the bill. Yeah. And if you take the, the action that they're after, you might as well not bother to have the bill. So this bill has one merit in that it now gives the right, as a result of <clears throat> legislation, for uh, Parliament to decide on those Rwanda uh, illegal refugees and to start shipping them over and not be gainsayed by uh, the, um, uh, the legal processes well, as well. I mean, this is the thing, this is the argument. We've got a lot of lawyers in the, in the House of Lords as well and, and judges and things saying, look, you know, you've got to have those legal uh, safeguards over who gets put on these planes. We know 150 people have been identified as the people who perhaps have the least chance of getting a, a legal challenge successfully through the court, so they're the most likely to be put on these planes. I have to say, I'll believe it when I see it if these planes ever take off and if we even get 150. Certainly the Rwandan government has said, look, they need it to be staggered. They have, you know, they've got one hotel ready and that's it. Um, has too much energy from the government, too much the bandwidth of what goes on in Downing Street being used to deal with this issue, which is nothing close to what Australia did. We're always told this is like what Australia did. It's not. You tr the boat people arriving in Australia, they never got set foot on shore. It, it basically ended that mass movement of people within a matter of weeks or months. No one thinks the Rwanda policy is going to do that. A handful of people, even a couple of hundred people out of the many tens of thousands who arrived, being sent to Rwanda to basically start the journey again, isn't going to put a dent into the illegal migration problem across the channel, is it? Well, uh, first of all, what is this about? This is not about sending every single refugee off to, uh, uh, off to a foreign land. What it's about is um, sending a, a very strong message to the people smugglers who spend their time charging these people to come across the channel in rickety boats. So it's a deterrent to that. In fact, there was... No, no, well, no, no. Nothing is going to deter people who are making... I think now it's at the going rate, it's five grand a place on a boat. Yeah, well, Nothing's going to deter will, people from doing that. That route will be deterred, because if you're going to spend all that money and you believe that on arrival you will not get a chance to make your case, that you will be simply shipped because you have come across illegally. That is the purpose of this particular legislation. And, of course, if you've got some money, you want to husband that money into the right places to get across, but not crossing by boats. It's the boat stuff, which is really heavily dangerous. The rest of migration has to be dealt with by tougher legal mm -hmm. action uh, as well alongside it. And that's the key. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of this migration issue, uh, people coming, you know, migrants coming in by other routes illegally, is also hugely down to this incredibly long process of challenge and challenge and challenge that goes on in the courts, which costs you to, some of money because you've got to house those people here yeah. while they're challenging their yeah. outcome. So this is a start, it's not the finish. Uh, we have a huge number of people coming into this country, uh, and I think we have a huge number of people who have put themselves beyond work. So you do the maths on that and you realise actually what we have to do is two things. One, get those people back to work and at the same time reduce migration. 
And yeah. businesses need to comply with that as well. And, and again, that's not just illegal migration, that is legal migration. And again, this yeah. is going to be one of the biggest issues of the next general election. We know it's a huge issue across Europe, it's a huge issue in the American election as well, not just illegal migration, but just sort of the sheer numbers of people uh, coming into countries. Now, at the end of the day, though, people will say, well, they, they made it very clear that one of the main reasons lots of people voted uh, for Brexit in 2016 was they wanted to have a say over who could come in this country or not. Uh, and 2019, again, talk about exactly immigration. Again and again, the polls have said, even you know, many Labour voters are still concerned about the sheer numbers, where are people going to live, etc. Integration, all these other issues. And yet we've seen sky high, I mean, absolute record levels of, of immigration under this government. Um, you can, even if you send hundreds of people to Rwanda, even if you send thousands of people to Rwanda, we've still got the issue that the government has quite happily given visas to, you know, three quarters of a million more people to come to this country net than have left the country in, in just a year when the British people have said repeatedly, that's too many people. One of the problems is um, the number of foreign students now coming over to study mm. are able to bring their families with them. And of course, that wasn't the case before. But that has opened the door to a, <clears throat> a very significant number of people coming in who get visas for that reason. And then those students somehow stay here afterwards uh, to find jobs, etc. And that means that they're here for a long period of time. So that's been one of the real reasons for the big increase. There are lots of other reasons too. Businesses are still not focused on now <clears throat> trying to uh, get British people to fill those jobs, uh, the training that's necessary. I, I remember having huge arguments with the, when I was Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, with the heavy goods industry, goods vehicles industry. I had a heavy goods vehicle, <clears throat> uh, a license myself, which I got after the army. It took me two weeks to get that. But the cost of that is, I think when I did it, was over £400 or whatever. Lots of unemployed people can't afford to, but yep. they do have driver's licences. And so, you know, they were bringing people in from all over the place, from Poland right the way through to outside Europe. And when I argued with them that if they only invested in getting those courses for those people, uh, they could have them then drive for a certain period of time like the army does before they could leave and move to another company. And when we argued all that stuff, they still said no, and they wanted to bring in ready train. Why? Because yep. they were probably cheaper yeah. than British. So it's time for the businesses to face up. They have a role to play in this as well, including in farming. Yeah, I mean, this is a massive issue for our economy, isn't it? Keeping on bringing more and more people in while we're leaving so many people on the scrap heap. Not good for them, not good for the economy. Um, Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, is making a speech tonight at delivering a lecture uh, where she's going to say that Britain faces a 1979 moment. Uh, she's also going to say that uh, she will promise a new chapter in Britain's economic history if Labour are elected. Um, what sort of... What sort of uh, I suppose, uh, 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 field, do you think that new chapter will have? Well, it'll be like the old chapter that they've always written every time they come into power. What's going to happen? <clears throat> because of external circumstances, the COVID, the huge spending on that, the cost of living crisis as a result of the war in Ukraine, thanks to Russia, all of those things have really battered not just our economy, but other economies. And all of them are in the same position, which they're trying to balance those budgets again and get back into a right line. So first of all, it would be nice if Labour were honest about where we actually were and that this wasn't down simply, simply to government policies. It has been a huge external blow to this country. No other time I can remember in my 30 years, or even some people say since the Second World War, have been buffeted so much uh, by external uh, areas. So when they come into power, they're going to face almost exactly the same uh, issues that the Conservative government faces there isn't huge amounts of money to throw around the place. And the councils, the Labour councils, are all demanding more money. And they say Labour will give it to them. They've got this green agenda where they have to be pushed back on the 28 billion they were suddenly going to throw at it. And now they're pretending they don't do it. So there's going to be a lot of pressure on them to spend like they had done in the past. And but the reality there, is. There isn't any money there. left. <laughs> oh, exactly right. That. And that's exactly what the last Labour, yeah. uh, uh, I think, uh, secretary, chief secretary wrote uh, when we took power in 2010. Yeah, so, there is no money left. Now, can I point out that you did now maybe a slip of the tongue, but you did just say when they come into power, not if they come into power. This is now the accepted wisdom, received wisdom. Labour are going to win the next uh, general election. Has the Tories given up on winning the next election? Is everything now just completely geared around either a scorched earth policy to make things as difficult as possible for the Labour Party, or is it just really now about trying to scrabble together as many seats as possible? No, no, the word when I was 
<clears throat> using was in reference to your uh, question about her plans uh, for coming into government. I don't actually believe uh, that the country wants Labour. I uh, see all the polling still says around half of the public have not made their minds up, even though they're very angry with us because of all the difficulties they've had, cost of living problems, et cetera, et cetera. All these things I understand. But when I go out and I do a lot, I have to tell you, they are not saying, I want Keir Starmer. In fact, I don't think I've ever heard a single person on the doorstep mention his name. Whereas in Maybe Mrs. In, Starmer says it occasionally. Well, I'm not sure about that. But in 1996, <laughs> um, in 1996, everybody said, I'm sorry, I'm voting for Blair. They were very clear about yeah. why, and that's because they didn't think there was a threat. And also because he had done lots of stuff to get rid of his extremists. The Labour Party at the moment is probably nearly half of them still very wedded to Corbyn and his policies and very wedded to, okay. the, uh, to the budget policies that Corbyn himself uh, okay. was very strong on. So this is going to be a real tussle for them. And I think the public knows that. And I think, therefore, they simply can't make their minds up. I, I know you've got to run to debate. I just want to ask you one final question. We've had all this talk about Tory leadership shenanigans and Penny Morden's name in the frame. We don't know, you know, right-wingers behind that or her people behind that. All this game. You were you know, Tory leader once. You faced an awful lot of, a, of this sort of talk. Um, how should Rishi Sunak handle it? Get on and leave it alone. I mean, the reality is, I thought over the weekend, that was just... A lot of internal nonsense. Uh, and the reality is there's is a lot to be getting on with in the next seven or eight months because the economy is turning and we do want to wait. Uh, interest rates should come down. Inflation will be coming down. Uh, that means we can further to this last budget, bring more taxes down as that uh, ends up with it. So there is lots that we will do over the next two to three months, making it very clear what the choice is at the next election as the economy improves. And so that's the reality. Secondly, there are lots of other issues. And I have to tell you, Uxbridge showed that net zero, the people want a cleaner environment, but they are not prepared to pay the trillions in tax that will come directly as a result of rushing to an end date yep. that is stupidly set in statute that shouldn't have been done so and now should be changed. In other words, we should get there as we can, as technology allows, without an, uh, afflicting a punishment beating on ordinary taxpayers, you know, in my area, in North London, they're furious about ULES, yeah. which was literally yeah. a revenue raiser for... Yeah, for, doesn't improve mayor. anything for anyone, yeah. But absolutely not at all, and there was a report of uh, TFLs reported to the mayor and he tried to bury it. So this is just awful. So we get rid of all of that, okay. turn those cameras on to criminal activity, uh, and most that would be an idea, wouldn't it? Um, I'm going to yeah, leave yeah. it there. I know you're going to make a dash off to uh, the debate in the comments. So, Doug Smith, thank you so much for joining us, former Conservative Party leader, of course. Still with me, listening to all of that, is Tom Slater, who's editor at Spiked Online. Um, let's just go back, if, if we can, a little bit, just just to sort of to Labour and what we're expecting from uh, from the speech from Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves. Um, it's a very fair point from Sir Ian Doug Smith, there, isn't it? That actually, you know. Uh, and again, I don't say, and it's a point I made in a, in a column in the Sun newspaper this morning, if you want to read this, um, is, that, is that whatever happens in the next election, whenever it is, and whoever wins it, exactly the same issues are in the in-tray. None of them go away, not one of them. Uh, you know, the, 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 the millions on the waiting list, the, 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 the God knows hundreds of billions in debt, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the problems we've got in terms of uh, millions on welfare who mm -hmm. are working age uh, and, and, and the illegal migration issue. I mean, you name it, they were just so, the net zero looming. I mean, that doesn't stand any contact with the, with the voters, does it, when people actually have those costs. Um, all these problems, they're still sitting there. None of them are going to be resolved by an actual election being held. So what hopes do you have that, uh, if at all, uh, that, Labour, yeah, that Labour are going to do any better at it than the Tories have done? I don't have particularly high hopes. I mean, as we were talking about earlier... You're from the left, though, aren't you? You're, you never guess it a lot of the time. <laughs> no, you really wouldn't, no, though. I mean, but your, this... your background is very much on the left. Absolutely, but I think in terms of this particular iteration of the, of the Labour Party, it's just a technocratic, authoritarian, quite woke... Institution. I don't know what that's got to do with um, the interests of the working class of this country, if anything. Yeah. It seems to me a pretty top-down project which seems to want to Well, they despise their values, the working class make, of this country. Make their lives much more working class people, they're, sort of, they're all gammon and racist and Brexiteers, aren't they? That's what uh, they think. This, this party does not represent those interests whatsoever. I think, if anything, to the extent that there is any enthusiasm for this 
um, Labour Party. It's amongst the metropolitan middle classes. Um, I think probably in terms of the next election, you're going to see a lot of people, those kind of red wall voters or just working class voters in general, who um, took a chance on the Conservatives are going to be sufficiently demoralised that they don't show up. Some of them will go yeah. back to Labour, no doubt, just wanting something a little bit of a change, something that might get us out of this mess. Um, but those that those who do, I think, are going to be in for a rude awakening. I think the problem is that we have tremendous problems confronting society. You were talking yeah. about it a bit with Ian Duncan Smith there. Not only external events, but also a lot of policies that successive governments have pursued. You can talk about of all, pa of all parties, yeah. You can talk about many economic policies. Also, the failure of successive governments to confront things like a chronic housing crisis and so on. All of that yeah, is coming did, home right, to I didn't even mention that. No one mentions that. That's probably one of the single biggest issues. Absolutely. All of that is kind of coming home to risk at once. Um, so we have all of these problems, and yet we have in the Labour Party, as well as in the Conservative Party, um, politicians who, whose real kind of default setting is just to kind of trundle along, easy as she goes, you know, steady hand at the tiller, all of those kinds of cliches. It's not going to be good enough. Um, and then if you layer on top of that the fact that a lot of the kind of social issues that are roiling society at the moment, we've been talking about the gender issue, we've been talking about the clampdown on the freedom of speech, the, what's often called the culture war, exactly. And especially if you talk about the environment as well, which is obviously also of huge economic consequence. They are at best, a bit worse than the Tories. And if you look at some of the individuals, much worse than yeah. the Tories. They really believe Ed it. Ed Miliband is a complete lunatic on this Absolutely. Stuff. And they that's something which is going to be of huge concern. So um, this is not a defence yeah. of the Tory party. I think they've completely squandered and screwed the opportunity that they were given. I think it's demonstrated that whilst there were a few people in the Tory party who got this new coalition they'd built for themselves, mm. who understood what Brexit was about. But a who lot understood really don't. Got, do a lot they? of them really don't. And a lot of them talk about Penny Morden this week, yeah. have very similar social views to the Labour Party. So yeah. this isn't an argument for They're the Conservative North, yeah. Party, but it is a, an argument that things are really... Things can only be, get better is not the slogan of this age. It's, it's not, yeah, exactly. Things things can't be any worse. Or, <laughs> you know, that, I mean, that, that, things really that really worse. shouldn't be how we're going into the next election, should yeah. it? Look, but today we are asking you about the Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Reeves, who is promising in a new speech tonight a new chapter in Britain's economic history. Uh, she says Britain faces 19, a 1979 moment if Labour are elected. I want to know, will they do a better job than the Conservatives or a worse job? Tell us why you think they will. Tell us why you think they won't. Give us a call, 0344 Text 87222. Get in touch on X at Talk TV. Richard has done that and says, I don't trust any of them from any party. The last 10 years have given us the worst politicians I've seen. Howard says, no, Labour, as usual, run out of other people's money. Uh, I think that this government's already run out of other people's money. Uh, we've also been asking about this new video of the Princess of Wales, which has prompted even more uh, online speculation and theories about uh, Kate's health. What should the palace do to end all the speculation? Andy says, actually, put her out there. Stand her in front of the press. Not a faraway video of her. It's really the only way it's going to work, isn't it? So you've also been getting in touch on the phones. Please do keep those calls coming in. Stuart is in Staffordshire. Uh, good afternoon to you, Stuart. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Um, so you want to talk about Rachel Reeves and, and, and a new chapter in Britain's economic history. Um, would Labour be better <laughs> or worse? <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. First of all, can I say, it's a dream come true. Um, yeah, I think, uh, to paraphrase Terry Pratt, it's going to be a whole new quantum level of indebtedness. Uh, uh -huh. The only thing that uh, Labour stands for nowadays, as you say on your programmes every day, I, is uh, EDI, and that's really all they are. Uh, they're still taking a, a... Again, I've been upstairs by Ian Duncan Smith. Uh, he said everything that I was going to say. Um, yeah. And as I say, um, Labour, Labour lost it many times ago. The only, the only real time they had sort of like um, financial kudos was Tony Blair, and he yeah. was... Famously quoted as being Margaret Thatcher's uh, uh, nephew. Love child or something. Well, yeah, you but know. then, of course, we were told by Gordon Brown when he was Chancellor under Tony Blake, and it was the end of boom and bust, and then we had a, a, the bust to end all bust, didn't we, uh, in, you know, in 2008 because of that deregulation of the banking system. Um, so, I mean, how, how, do you mind me asking, feel free not to answer, it's a private vote, but how you voted in 2019 and how you're planning to vote this time round? Uh, to be honest, Julia, I, again, it's one of those things. I spoiled my ballot paper last time. Did you? Uh, I spoiled, and I, I'll, I'll probably end up, end up spoiling it, uh, but only because I've had a lot of dealings with the local 
MP. Right. And, but but, but at least you're going out. My thing is, that if, if, you know, millions of people spoil ballot papers, that, that is a statement of itself. Yeah. So you're not happy with the option. It's very so important. you should go to the polling station and do it. Yeah, it's very important that everybody gets out and votes. Absolutely. And, and gives their opinion, because that's the only way the politicians will know what we think. Absolutely. Really appreciate it. Dream come true for me as well, Stuart Stafford. Thank you very much indeed. Coming up after the break, more on Rachel Reeves' pledge of national with you. And I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia hartley Brew, and you are with Talk TV. Now, Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves, we've been talking about this all morning. Are we pledging a decade of national renewal if Labour wins the general election? In a speech this evening, she's going to compare their challenges to those faced by Margaret Thatcher in 1979. She's promising a new chapter in Britain's economic history. We've been asking your thoughts on all of this as well. First, though, let's get the thoughts of a former advisor to Gordon Brown, who's just come up in conversation, and a political economic uh, economy professor, sorry, Michael Jacobs. Uh, good afternoon to you, Michael. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. My, uh, Tom Slater also still with us, still in the studio. Get his thoughts in just a moment. Um, this, uh, this big speech, this is quite a sort of a significant uh, event uh, for, for, for sort of, I suppose, policy wonks who know about these things, the annual Mays Lecture in the City of London. Uh, Rachel Reeves is going to say that she vows that a Labour government will work with business to create a decade of national renewal, and she's likening the economic challenge or waiting the next government to that faced by Margaret Thatcher. Very different from when Labour got into power, Tony Brown, Gordon Brown, in 1997, when the economy was in great shakes, 
Um, it certainly it looks more like 79 than 97 this year, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Uh, and uh, we are clearly in a very difficult economic situation. Um, and the inheritance of whoever wins the next election, obviously looks like it's going to be Labour, will be pretty dire, which is not a good commentary on the last 15 years of Conservative governments. Um, 1979 is a very good comparison year, in fact, because not only did Margaret Thatcher um, uh, rule for the next 10 years, um, but the kind of economic policy she brought in was very different from the one that had previously been practiced during the 1970s. Um, and there was a major change in 1979 um, in the way in which economies were governed in the UK, but also in the US and elsewhere. And I think it's very clever of Rachel Reeves to say, look, we're now facing another moment like that, not only because of the depth of the crisis, but because we need a very different approach to ruling the economy in the next decade from the previous one. But, but what is Labour going to be able to do differently? As we've been discussing on the show, you know, every single thing in the intray of Rishi Sunak right now will be exactly the same sort of stuff uh, that is in the intray of any other Tory leader if he was uh, deposed before the next election, and Sir Keir Starmer if he wins the next election, most likely now to be in the autumn. Um, it's exactly the same issue. You've got the same level of national debt, the same number of people who are on NHS waiting list, same number of people who are, are not working but are of working age and paying tax. You've got the same same tax levels, people are angry about that. You've got, OK, cost of living might improve, but, you know, it's not like... People talk about inflation coming down. It's not like, oh, well, we're going to go back to the prices we had two years ago. No, we're not. They're going to stay high and they're just going to carry on going up, but at a lower rate. People are still going to feel poorer. You've got the immigration issues. You've still got Ukraine. You've possibly got future issues internationally with China and goodness knows what else. You've got energy prices, the net zero. I mean, it's all the same stuff. Housing crisis, you name it. It's all the same stuff. So what is Labour going to do differently with the economy that will, A, lead to growth, be nice to have some of that at some point, and, B, get enough money in to, I suppose, spend on anything else? Well, I'm not sure what your point is. Of course, the intray is exactly the same for whoever takes government, uh, takes uh, office in, after a general election. But the point is, what's in the outray? What will uh, uh, a Labour government do differently? And we have some idea of that. I think not everything. So firstly, they will, uh, uh, they will adopt an industrial strategy. So rather than just leaving private sector companies to decide where and how to invest, they will encourage investment in key industries, and in key parts of the country. There was a moment when it looked like Boris Johnson might be interested in doing that, but he abandoned the levelling up uh, agenda and uh, the industrial strategy agenda. So there's a very different approach to the role of government in encouraging investment in the sectors and parts of the country we need, oh. the kind of thing that is generally... But, 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 in, since in when do economies. civil servants or, or politicians know better than individuals running private companies where best to invest and what to invest in? I mean, no, I'm not sure the government's got a good track record on that. No, they don't know better. What they can do is that they can provide them with the assistance and with, in some cases, the money to help push them into parts of the economy, the sectors and the regions that they're not otherwise doing. This is what's happening in the rest of Europe. It's what's happening in the United States. The United States has now got record growth levels because of the encouragement of government into particularly the green sectors. And no, 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 no. America has got record doing. growth and levels. Wants to do something similar America has got record growth levels because they're now the world's biggest fossil fuel producers. They've invested in, in, in fossil fuels and have now got cheaper energy in a better benefiting from those no, higher energy costs no, no, and, really and, and because of a basically Julia, a hidden, Julia, an American first Julia, policy of investment in, in American manufacturers. Look at the evidence on where American energy is coming from. Yes, they have fossil fuels, but they have also invested hugely in renewables. And because they're not dependent only in Ameri on only American supplies, companies. Because they're not dependent on Russian supplies and Middle Eastern supplies of oil, they don't suffer this enormous volatility and the huge increases in energy prices. Because they frack, the problem, which Labour's opposed UK, to. Because they frack. Finished, the problem that we have in the UK is we are dependent on overseas fossil fuels. The ones that we produce in the North Sea don't come back into the British economy, they're exported. So those overseas fossil fuels give us these very volatile and over recent years, much higher energy prices. So the shift to renewables, which is of course no. what the Conservative government has done no. as well as the Labour government promises no. to do, fracking. is a way of reducing no. energy fracking. prices and energy fracking. No, no, no. Be oil exploration and fracking is why America is doing well. If you have high energy costs, you have a you have a more expensive economy and people can't afford to invest. But, but the key thing about but the key thing about renewables aren't going to do it. Policy, 
Julia, the key thing about economic policy in America is they are directing private sector finance into the green industries. That's what the Inflation Reduction Act is doing. And really billions of dollars are now being invested in those areas. So that's what Labour wants to do. It won't be on the same scale, but it wants to help private business move into those sectors that will be successful globally and that will provide jobs yeah. in, in different... Well, in I mean, I have to say, uh, that's not other. holding out much... And that's hope. a major different... That's a way of approaching economic policy, okay. which is different from the last 40 years. But again, years. where are they getting the money and from that? that? Is this, what this, generate the growth. The £28 billion pound green fund is kind of like kind of being sort of shoved into the corner and disappeared. Then it's become, well, £28 billion pounds a year, but by the end of Parliament, that's, you know, that, that money ain't there anymore. You know as well as I do that uh, the, the last budget, the absolute sort of where is the rabbit from the hat budget from Jeremy Hunt, um, uh, actually took away an awful lot of the funding. Basically, that money's already been spent and accounted for uh, by the Tories in terms of national insurance cuts and other, and other things. Um, Rachel Reeves, as a shadow chancellor, is going to have to kind of get back to the drawing board to come up with more of that. In terms of, in terms of that investment, OK, if that worked, great. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I, I kind of think that governments should get out of the way of private companies. I think that's... But that's a, what they have been doing for 15 years. We've had no, the they, no, growth, no, I don't uh, think there's any private companies that feel so that way about policy, that, Michael. Your policy, Julia, but, uh, might have worked, but it hasn't worked. And so something else is okay, needed. OK, we're going to try something else that won't work. Brilliant. We're using taxpayers' money. Here's the... Well, what, it's what working else, in okay, other countries, so the evidence is, suggests that it will work. Well, well, if you're going to talk about growth levels in many European countries, I think big question marks there as well, Michael. Let, let's talk there about how you would deal with things like, you know, sluggish growth. You're saying, OK, we're going to invest in some of these industries, but the, the growth levels in this country have Investment been is sluggish the for decades. Productivity. Sluggish for decades. What gives, How, what gives you better productivity, Julia? What gives you better productivity technology. is investment. Now, and we have very low investment. Let me finish. Why have we governments have not done investment. that? No, we you interrupted low... me. I was trying to get to a yes, question. But I'm, you're meant to be asking me questions. No, That's I the didn't way get to the question because you interrupted me. No, no, but, but you, you raise a, a, an important point, productivity. The point, Julia, is why, why have a person on unless you let them speak? You, to, you talk You can loads. speak the whole of your programme. And you can interview Michael, somebody. Darling, who's you, you can carry on you, moaning you or you can make your left. point. Sorry, and I mean, this is embarrassing. You're a grown man. Line, Do know. grow up, Michael. You've talked for plenty of time. I was getting to a point about what else you're going to do. If you just want to whinge for the next few minutes about not getting enough time, then carry on. But you're only wasting your own time. Oh, he's going to not talk. Should we, should we, should we end it there? I go now? If so, you want you to. raised the important point about productivity. How do you get better productivity? You get better productivity through investment. The UK has one of the lowest rates of business investment and pretty much the lowest rate of public investment of any major industrialised country. So one of the things Labour will do is it will put money in through public investment and that should encourage private investment. And that's how you get productivity up and that's how you will get growth up. And the reason we've not seen that growth over the last 15 years under Conservative governments is because investment has been so low. OK, so but you know why investment has been so low today. in the private sector? To Michael, it's because no one needed to invest because we had lots and lots of abundant cheap labour because we imported people from abroad. That is still a labour policy. Mm, extraordinarily, it's still a Tory policy. You ain't going to persuade companies to invest in technology when they can employ half of Eastern Europe to come in. Um, and uh, you, so you're completely right. Um, and uh, the a uh, uh, and. Uh, but you then need to say, well, how do we make that more difficult? And the way Labour, uh, the, how do we make that flexible labour market a bit more difficult? Labour has said we're going to increase the rights to working people. So, for example, banning zero hours contracts, enabling workers to have rights from day one. Even now, though what that will do, no one will employ will anybody. It will, raise, it will raise wages and conditions at the bottom, and that will encourage not only higher incomes, obviously, but also investment in the machinery and equipment, which will actually give us progress. Even, even the Labour Party, even the Labour Party wasn't paying minimum Labor. wage to their own, their own, their own staff. They still employ unpaid interns, for goodness sake. Okay, just finally, um, given the given the state of the economy, given the the, the, the dire states we're in. With the best will in the world, no government, whichever is elected, with these sort of like sort of half-hearted ideas are going to make a massive big change. We're going to be seeing lots of culturals. That's where this is going to turn into. That's going to be end up being the big dividing line uh, between the Conservatives and Labour, isn't it? Well, only if the Conservatives make it so. And if they, well, if they think don't that's say anything. Really, if the, if the Conservatives really think that what really matters to the British public are culture war issues 
then I don't think they've understood the British public. What the British public okay. wants to know is, when is our NHS going to be better? When is our economy going to start growing? When are we going to get jobs and, uh, and high streets improved and so on in the towns and cities around the country? Those are the things that matter to the British public. And it isn't Labour who pursues culture wars. It is always people <laughs> on the right of politics in the Conservative Party and programmes like your own, which have pursued issues... Well, to like talk, talking about rights, women being... Um, women facing criminal records, people. Michael, for, for saying that a trans... A, a trans-identified man is a man. And you're saying that it's people like me in the right who are bringing up the culture yes. wars. Oh, ask, come on. ask the public how many people think that's an important issue facing the country. It's tiny. But it, they, they, know, they may not think it's as important as the important economy and housing and immigration, but they absolutely do absolutely. think it's important. And so Labour has a plan for housing. It is going to relax the planning rules and build more houses. So that's a real issue. Okay. That's one facing, we will see. real issue facing millions of people around the country. But the culture war issues just aren't. Okay. And that's why, I'm, if you want a proper debate, about this election, which really needs to the move needs on. of the people... I've got to move on. ..then let's focus on those issues that really affect the people. Michael, thank you for joining us. I hope you felt you had plenty of time to speak. Michael Jacobs, former yeah. advisor. In the end. Go back and watch the video. You'll be perfectly happy. You had plenty of time to talk, Michael. Thank you for joining us. Tom Slater is still with me. Oh, a little bit of a little bit of a yeah. strop there. Um, but, I mean, let's leave the culture wars thing aside. I'm so fed up with people that go, oh, everyone's raised the culture wars. <laughs> well, tell you what, if you stop taking away women's rights, we won't have to start complaining about it. Not to dwell on it, but it is like a conspiracy theory is peddling. Like, th there's nothing there. It's just that's, that's Suella Braveman thing. and yourself, you meet in a room somewhere yeah. and you invent these issues yeah. so as to have something to talk about. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Uh, absolutely, it really is. Um, I, I, you have any faith that we're going to see um, this wonderful investment and this turning around of our economy? I mean, it sounds good on paper. Mm -hmm. First of all, is the point that anyone who thinks this Labour government can do anything other than tinker around the edges of the current kind of deadening consensus around a lot of these issues is going to be in for a rude awakening. The other thing is, what is it that they want to plunge all this investment into? It's always no hope of green projects. Because which... because because if they were if they were actually a project that was actually going to make money and be successful, they wouldn't need government investment because the private sector would already be happy to invest in it. Ta da! I don't think civil servants and politicians are good at making these judgments. Otherwise. They'd probably be successful business people. Anyway, uh, let's get back to your, my questions to you about what uh, Rachel Reeves is promising in terms of a new chapter in Britain's economic history if they're elected. Will Labour do a better job than the Tories? Uh, tell us why they will, tell us why they won't. Uh, give us a call, 0344 499 1000. Text 8722. Get in touch on X at Talk TV. Fiona's done that and says, after 14 years of managed decline, it will be extremely difficult for Labour to do worse. Oh, uh, that's a challenge they're willing to accept. Uh, Terry says, I don't know about better, but they would have to be pretty bad to be worse. I mean, this is this is real talking up of Labour, isn't it? Um, and uh, I think it would just be different. Uh, and fingers crossed, there is a positive outcome. I mean, there is that. We sh whoever gets in, we need them to do a good job because we, our country depends on it. We're also asking about that new video of Princess of Wales, which has prompted more online conspiracy theories about her health. Of course it has. What should the palace do to end the speculation about Kate Albee says, nothing. They have a right to privacy. They're the ones who invoke their own privacy. But there we are. Uh, you've also been getting in touch on the phones. Let's go to Mark, who is in Carlisle. Uh, good afternoon to you, Mark. You want to talk uh, about uh, this speech tonight. What do you want to say about Labour's economic policy? <coughs> well, I'm, I'm in I love that sound. Area. Oh. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Yeah, carry on. I'm in a Labour council area, and I mean, you give one example. I'm dying for a coffee, and the the only cafe society around here is a countryside petrol station with a coffee machine with a three-legged milking stool. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very There's a bus every two weeks to this village. I'm not joking. No one believes me. Every two weeks, there's a bus only once every two weeks. Once every two anyway, weeks. I want to call. I want to call for Conservatives to merge with reform and they'll win the next election. Next, next election. Right, OK. People Tories don't want to merge with reform. Re half of the Tories definitely despise reform. Reform have said, Richard Tyson said, we are not going to do a deal like we did in 2019. We're not. Oh, why has he said that? Is that because he wants people to vote for reform, I'm guessing? Are people such? They're going to let Keir Starmer and Labour in. Is that stupid? But isn't that, no, but isn't that up to individual voters to decide? Maybe the individual voters will say, I, you know, I, whoever they are, I'm going to vote for the party that I actually care about, whichever one that is, regardless of the outcome. I mean, some people vote tactically, but not everyone. 
this country has to stop just voting Labour because you're working class, voting Conservative because you're middle and upper. I'm from a council state of Virginia. I'm now a landowner. Vote for people who are going to do something. Look at the policies. Labour are just flip-flopping. I'm going to protest outside Keystone um, Party office. I'm going to dress as a skeleton because all the skeletons are discovered. I'm going to wear and give out flip-flops. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Mark, thank you very much indeed. You, you go off and get that coffee at that petrol station now, Mark and Carla. Coming up after the break, the street artist Banksy has confirmed that he's responsible for a new mural on the side of a block of flats in North London. It's just as horrible as all the other uh, Banksy murals. But is this really art or is it just vandalism and graffiti? I'm Julia Hartley Brewer and you're with Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've> got to... <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley-Brew. You're with Talk TV. Now, in the last few minutes of the show, I want to talk about street artist Banksy. I say street artist. He's worth about 40 million quid. But he's confirmed that he is responsible for a new mural on the side of a block of flats in North London. Uh, it is in Finsbury Park. It appeared overnight. It's basically... There's a, it's, a, it's a white wall, if you, if you haven't seen the image. It's a white wall, and he's spray-painted a whole load of green paint behind a tree that has had all its branches, basically, well, the, the, the twigs cut off. It only really works looking like a tree if the tree is still not in bloom and hasn't grown all its, uh, its uh, smaller branches and leaves. But, no, he has claimed that uh, he is the man behind it. But the question is, is this really art? 
or is he just a vandal? Uh, actually just using graffiti because I'm not sure I'd want this on the side of my home. Joining me right now to discuss this is art critic Estelle Lovat. Uh, good afternoon to you, Estelle. Hi, Julia. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I have to say, I, I'm of the view that... Um, and I'm always about, I don't know much about art, but I tell you what, I do think that Banksy's art is incredibly sort of greetings card derivative, something I'd expect to see in M&S uh, rather than would expect to see uh, in an art gallery. I mean, he's made an absolute fortune. His big thing is, oh, oh, who knows who I am? I'm not sure that not knowing for sure who Banksy is and his artwork appearing in the street makes it good art. Isn't, isn't just spray painting the side of someone else's property just a criminal act of graffiti? Well, let, let me address three things that you've mentioned there, which are really interesting. First of all, you said in your intro that you wouldn't necessarily really want it on the side of your house. I'd have it on the side of my house because it would put the price of my house up by a couple of hundred grand. Um, then you were saying about um, a greeting card. There's nothing wrong with making an honest living through selling no. greeting cards. No, and, I agree and, with that. But, but, but people who do that aren't fated as great artists, which he is. Well, yeah, and, and let's have a look at why. Why is he painting or stenciling on walls? That's not a new art activity. That yeah. goes right back to cave art, right, and cave painting, even on the inscriptions inside the pyramids of Egypt, right through to today. But is graffiti an act of vandalism? It is very complex because it depends on the location, the quality of the artwork and the message, and also the right for the artist to have freedom of expression. Personally, and, and I'd like to talk to you about what his message is in, in this piece mm. of the trees. Personally, I would rather have him bringing the community together through art, which in essence is what a Lowry painting does, you know, when he's painting loads of people in by the factory standing mm. outside and with a cap and, and their whip it talking. Um, I'd rather see him and his artwork bringing the community get together rather than the activists throwing a tin of soup at a work oh, of I art. Oh, I mean, yeah, I'll take, gallery. I'll absolutely take that. But the fundamental thing is, it's like, you know, if he wants to buy a big house or buy a wall and then do, and then, and then spray paint it, that's one thing. But on someone else's house, yes, I know you say, you know, okay, you'd I'd add value, but I would just say like, okay, someone can strip off the side of the wall and buy it off me. I don't want it there. At the end of the day, again, if it's, if it's the same piece of art, but it's done by a 15-year-old with a spray can, which it could easily be done by, then the, if, he, if he does it, it's worth a fortune in its art. And if, and if a 15-year-old does it, you know, while, you know, bunking off school, then it's just graffiti and they'd be punished for it. I, I don't see why, just because he's a very rich, successful artist, he gets the right to deface buildings, but no one else does. If that was my building, I'd have him prosecuted. Yeah, I mean, th that's interesting where um, he becomes somewhat a, a talented uh, and very technically skilled artist versus the 15 year old who's, who's about to sit his um, GCSEs. Um, and don't forget, you know, talking of which, Damien Hurst didn't get a good grade in his art school exams, <laughs> but. Well, you know, what is the message behind this piece? First of all, we've got this um, glorious English lush countryside green, which happens to also be the colour of, of green that Islington Council use. There's a nod to St Patrick's Day. She's oh. holding a pressure spray. So it makes it relevant today because nowadays, what do we talk about? The must-have accessories, a, a pressure spray, a coffee machine and an air fryer, right? So it dates it to today. And he's also talking about what we're doing to the planet. Of to course the he is. Of course he is. That's how he gets the woke brigade that on. I just think it's. I think it's just. Re I don't even like the shade of green. I think it's really ugly. I would spray paint it off today if it was up to me. I'm going to have to leave it there. It's such a pleasure oh. having you on the show, uh, Estelle Lovett. Do come back again. Thank you so much, Tom Sater. I've got to give you time to have your say. What do you think <laughs> of his art? I've always found the problem with Banksy is less that he's some sort of outlaw vandalising buildings and so on. It just seems really naff, like for supposedly for some sort of outsider artist, someone who's being edgy and dangerous and whatever. He has a tremendous knack for just reflecting back the views and prejudices of the sort of liberal elite, yeah. effectively. It's on the environmental stuff, some really naff Brexit-related stuff. Yeah. The kind of sense that ordinary people are just sort of in the rat race and really downtrodden and so on. 
it's um, it's the least edgy form of edgy art ever, in a sense. Yeah, That's absolutely. I, I just think it's really, I just genuinely really object to people. I don't want people tagging on a on a train or on a bridge or anything. I just I just think it's just really bizarre that people go, oh no, but if he does it, these people, if a, if a teenager did that on their site, well, they'd be absolutely furious. But oh, but it, but he's done it, so it's absolutely fine. And yeah, I'm mean, okay. If you did it, on, I mean, I don't own a house, but if you did it on the side, at least you could try and you know have it scraped off mm -hmm. and. And, and, and sell it brick by brick, I guess, and then it'd be worth doing. But anyway, Tom Slater, such a pleasure to have had your company today. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Talking about lots of the biggest stories of the day and Banksy. Uh, Sally, we have come to the end of the show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please do join me same time tomorrow. Up next, it's Kevin and Alex. Have a great afternoon. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer, and you're on Talk TV. Well done. Now. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth.